there's this conservative wave of fear-mongering from mm. some kind of radical, subversive, anti-American new trend. And mm. every time that thing, that trend is ill-defined, it's vaguely conceptualized, but it's a systemic existential threat to the world. And mm. everything is justified as a response. That stuff scares me way more than the worst excesses of whatever Robin D'Angelo writes about. <laughs> Hey everybody, tonight we're debating critical race theory and we're starting right now with Vosh's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us, Vosh. The floor is all yours. Hi, I'm Vosh. Okay, so <clears throat> critical race theory is a subject that many people are discussing right now. It is certainly a hot topic and the frustration that I have is that usually when we talk about critical race theory, we do so in the context of what's being taught to our kids, like in school. Now, critical race theory really isn't being taught to people outside of a collegiate level. Sometimes it's even a post-grad thing in sociology, criminal justice studies, and in legal studies, which has a different definition for critical race theory, because this is a fairly esoteric, you know, academic theory. Usually when conservatives talk about critical race theory, they're referring to something else, some something they don't like about anti-racist theory or or something that I guess they would have called anti or like reverse racist a couple of years ago. Actually, I think that's a good one. I feel like I've noticed that quite a bit, actually. A couple of years ago, like, oh, this thing is reverse racist. And now it's, oh, well, this is what happens when critical race theory, you know, infiltrates the minds of our youth or whatever. Anyway, uh, uh, the feeling that I get when talking about these issues is that nobody's working with the same set of definitions. So Instead of fixating on the esoteric terminology of varying use and very, very limited application, maybe we should just focus on the very specific ideas that we do or don't like, because it's entirely possible we'll end up agreeing about some of them. I know there are elements of left-leaning anti-racism that I think are highly counterproductive. I see them all the time. I respond to them. I just responded to one on TikTok literally yesterday. I know this happens. Maybe it would be better to focus on those elements, the sub points, rather than the terminology itself. So those are my thoughts, I think. Thank you very much. And we will kick it over to Kendon. We are thrilled to have you, Kendon. Want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. And we hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you were from. With that, Kendon, thanks for being with us. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, James. Uh, yes, my name is Kendon Farr. I am TikTok famous, which is uh, which is probably the worst kind of famous. Um, I just before I carry on, I want to thank two people uh, for making this conversation. Well, in addition to James and Bosch for actually being here, and James for organising it. Uh, Leo Phileas, who's probably in the chat somewhere, who planted the seed of this conversation, and my friend Stephen Ryan, who runs a YouTube channel called Cider and Port, who kind of made sure that this happened. Um, so thank you very much. Go and check him out. He's, he's all right, really. Uh, yeah. So I. I appreciate Vosh's um, candor and I appreciate Vosh's generosity when it comes to the actual terms because, to be quite honest, I, he's right in that sense that critical race theory, maybe I'm not talking about critical race theory, maybe that's not what I'm actually objecting to. Um, we, you know, there are things, I think we ought to define what I'm not debating before we move on to what I'm actually contesting. So racism exists, uh, there is a legacy of racism and it can affect populations in the Western world and all Western countries to this day. Um, so I'm not, dis and I believe that people who don't look like me suffer it more than I do. So I'm not contesting that at all. Um, the problem is not the problem it's the solution that troubles me um critical race theory as i have read about it and as i've seen it implemented and as i've seen it discussed by tiktok youtube and other platforms uh strikes me as collectivist and authoritarian uh it ignores individual um circumstances um as someone who's a mild conservative which in american terms makes me a liberal um i find critical race theory not so much um, appall appalling, but terrifying. There is something about it that scares me. I'm not entirely certain what it is about. So I think it's because it is collectivist that ignores the individual and suggests that um, all discrepancies between racial groups are entirely the product of systemic racism. At least, again, this is how I've heard about it. Um, and I find that sort of thing creepy, the herding of human beings creepy. Um, I'm prepared to go delve a little deeper into that, but as an opening statement that's the best that i've got james so i'll, I'll just throw that back throw it back over to you you got it thanks very much kenan for that opening and before we go into open dialogue folks want to let you know if you haven't subscribed yet we have many more juicy debates coming up so hit that subscribe button right now as we have a 
For example, folks, bottom right of your screen tomorrow, JF and Alex Stein will collide on whether or not the police are systematically racist. So that should be a juicy debate. You don't want to miss it. So do hit that subscribe button as well as that notification bell as well. And so with that, thanks, gentlemen. The floor is all yours. Okay. Um, all right. I'm really, really happy that we don't have to spend a bunch of time arguing the nuances of the extent to which CRT means any of this. Unfortunately, the fault is kind of on everyone's side because left-leaning people will also say, oh, they don't teach CRT in schools. This is what CRT is. And then they'll list out something that has nothing to do with CRT, which is incredibly frustrating for me. But I feel like we can leave all that aside and just talk about the underlying ideas. So you talk about um, what's, I guess, essentially equality versus equity here. I think that's one of the big lines that a lot of people take disagreement on. So with regards to this, the line that I usually hear is like, okay, so we acknowledge that there are biases between the outcomes of groups in our society because, at least in part due to racism, we know, of course, the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow has had some effect on average income and education and blah. We can agree on that. But then the subsequent statement is, well, is it entirely attributable to that? Um, and then obviously you get into questions of like, um, you know, genetics or, uh, or, or are there other factors of culture, individual responsibility. So the question I have then, I guess I would ask you is if, if you did not have any broader social biases against one of two groups, what would explain disparate outcomes amongst averages between those groups? So obviously individuals will always vary, but like if there was no systemic racism, what could explain black people on average having lower social outcomes than white people? Well, it depends because I mean, uh, I don't, I, I, I will answer the question, but it's a bit of a long one, Gosh. Um, uh, you might, must have read, um, heard that in the UK, there was a report published by the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities that was commissioned by Boris Johnson, led by a chap called Tony Sewell, who's a black British Caribbean guy. Uh, to talk about that, to answer that very question, you know, is racism the number one cause for discrepancies between racial groups? And he identified that in, well, because the thing is, well, the, the, the problem that I've got with this conversation in particular, Bosch, is that it's very much an American conversation, but a lot of these ideas are being, are being imperfectly transposed to other countries, particularly English speaking ones, like Britain, of course, and Ireland and other places, which also have a history of racism, but it's not American racism. It's not slavery, Jim Crow, that sort of thing. And so a lot of this stuff doesn't quite translate. Um, so for example, you say black, but again, the question then becomes, what do you mean by black? So J Tony, uh, Dr. Sewell in his report and in conversation with people discussing the report said, black Caribbeans, or people, yeah, black people from the Caribbean or of Caribbean descent have starkly different academic results from black Africans who live in Britain. Now, obviously, again, this is not a universal constant. It's not like or one group is always failing, one group is always successful. But you can see that on average, they tend to do better. Um, Iraq Africans tend to perform better academically than black Caribbeans. And his argument wasn't, this doesn't, what this proves is that there is a, um, a cultural distinction uh, between African communities in Britain and Caribbean communities in Britain. Again, not universal constants. You can't you can't be generic about this. That's where it all goes wrong. But it could be parenting style. It could be social pressures. Depending, it could be class, it could be um, cultural expectations, all of these little, well, I say little things, they're massive, aren't they? I mean, just talk to a sociologist, these are huge. Um, but uh, yeah, all of these factors can also have a bearing on performance for my minority groups in, say, white, I don't like the phrase white majority, but we'll have to use it, white majority countries. So all of these little things, because as I say, I'm sure we're going to agree on this, race isn't real. It's not a real, it's a social construct. It's not, it's not a thing. So you can't say, well, it's down, it's down to the genes or something, because that's just pseudo-intellectual anti-scientific horseshit. Um, but there are I, social and cultural factors, the, like, such as the ones I've mentioned, have a massive impact on outcomes, on, so on you know professional and academic. Sorry, I'll stop rambling now. I'll let you respond. No, not at all. So it's true that the legacy of racism is very different between America and the UK. I'm obviously rather limited to the examples that I have with regards to America. Um, I mean, the UK, of course, in England, it had slavery as well. I know that there are yeah. laws and they, they abolished it earlier and stuff. So there's always going to be some degree of variance there. The, the, so it's interesting to me you brought up the, um, the, the Caribbean immigrants because we also have something like that here in America. 
See, <clears throat> when we're talking about African immigrant groups here in America, they actually outperform American natives, just people who have been born here in America, in almost yeah. every metric across the board. Like Nigerian yeah. immigrants, for example, their IQ, their income, their educational attainment, insane compared to ours, just absolutely up there. And the reason mm -hmm. for that is because the process of immigration selects for a different set of qualifiers. Usually, all the poorest and least educated people in Nigeria probably can't afford to move to the United States. Whereas if you're born here in America, black, white, Asian, whatever, you could be from any socioeconomic class. The wealthiest Asians in our country are first or second generation immigrants from Asia. Mm -hmm. The poorest mm -hmm. ones came here back in the 1800s. So there are always a ton of like, it, it feels it's very granular because the more you look into the subdivisions between these groups, the more individual reasons you find for over or under performance by some social metrics. But the question, I mean, if we isolate everything down fundamentally, you know, let's say we're talking about um, just natives. Do you mind if I use America just because I'm more familiar with it? Broadly? Yeah, I, I expected you to, to be honest. I mean, you, know. Yeah. you know how we are. Well, um, no, I mean, you are American. You understand your culture better than mine just as i understand mine better than yours i mean i figured all of your examples are going to be american just because how could they be anything else i mean that's that's fair enough and, and this let's face it critical race theory comes from harvard from the 1970s so it's gonna ultimately it's an american thing so carry on yeah i'm glad this conversation is a testament to the triumph of multiculturalism then uh here in here in america um with um with regards to like the disparities between racial groups so we have to like isolate a variable let's take native white people and native black people black people their history can be traced back hundreds of years almost certainly for white people let's say at least 100 years past so we're talking like people who would never consider themselves anything but american many many differences in terms of average iq educational attainment blah blah now many of these things can be directly attributed to racism right you know there are biases in the criminal justice system the way cops treat x and y stuff like that and then you have redlining you know where are these families growing up where a lot of black families are growing up in neighborhoods that have way lower housing values and since most schools get funded by property taxes if the houses are cheap so are the schools and if you go mm -hmm. back further than that you let's say you isolate those variables right and you find black families and white families born in the same neighborhoods in areas with very low latent levels of racism who have never interacted with the criminal justice system there still tend to be disparities and sometimes then people talk about like um culture there you know but then yeah. the question is, like, where does culture come from? You know, it comes from environment or genetics, right? And I don't think black people are, like, genetically predisposed to a different type of culture. So it seems no. like, a, right, a lot of black culture, I'm speaking very generally here, seems like there's uh, an aversion to the police, that there seems to be some glorification of, like, gang culture or criminality and, like, gangster rap, for example. You could argue, yeah. like, white boys from the suburbs consume this music more than almost any other group. But in terms of what we associate it with, there's definitely like a connection there. And a lot of that comes from like historically anti-systemic and anti-cop attitudes in the black community, which were, especially when these songs came out, super justified. So it feels like when people make the equality versus equity argument, if you go back far enough, there's almost always an excuse for a disparity. And it almost always does come down to racism between racial groups, obviously. If it was between gendered groups, then I would say otherwise, I'd say it comes down to some kind of, well, it's either biological or conditional right um and that to address that if one were to you would arrive at a world where on average black americans white americans asians whatever would perform almost identically in every major social uh, way not between individuals but as populations that would be almost identical and i think that's what people mean when they talk about like you called it collectivism it's not the idea that everyone has to be the same it's the idea that absent these barriers there really wouldn't be a reason for like, there to be these big differences between racial groups, you know? Mm. There, well, yes, but this, I, I see your point, but I would raise you this question mm -hmm. um, with, with regard to differences between racial groups in terms of cultural impact. Um, one of, you, actually hit, you actually have hit a point that I want to make um, with about regards to this. Um, you talk about sort of like gang culture, hip hop subculture, anti-cop, anti-government, anti-white sentiment from hip hop and things like that. A lot of that stuff is poisonous to young minds. If you're born into an Amer into an environment whereby you you are convinced that you cannot possibly succeed because you're the wrong color, or you're you know you're you just don't have the same life chance as anyone else, there's almost an incentive not to try. Um, I should come clean on this one. I used to be a teacher. I'm a qualified high school teacher. Um, I don't do that anymore because I 
recovered my sanity. And um, I, I was trained to encourage everybody. And one of the things that you're trained as a teacher to notice and to deal with is self-doubt. The, a lack of self-belief in students. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, all black people are children. That's not where I'm going with this. But there's a there's a kind of mentality, it's a victim mentality. That's a phrase that I hear an awful lot now. Victim mentality going around, which is propagated by certain cultural and social forces that needs to be defeated. One of the reasons, and again, I'm speaking only for the UK, I can't speak for America. And then again, we're speaking in general terms anyway, so you're going to find exceptions to this. British Africans come to Britain, I mean, or Africans come to Britain and become British, or they are born and raised in Britain, um, come to Britain with hope, with expectation, with ambition. And they don't all come across as middle class people. I know a lot of, I mean, you probably know this, our NHS is propped up by foreign medical staff, for example. Most of the people, who, it seems like half the people who work for the NHS were not born and raised in this country. Um, but they come over, you know, they work manual jobs, they do office work. Um, I work with a lot of Nigerians in my place of work, for example. Um, but they come to Britain with a sense of hope, a sense of optimism. So that even if I don't succeed, my children or my grandchildren will. And that that sort of idea, that sort of belief, even if it's misplaced, when transmitted, is socially constructive and individually beneficial. But if that's missing for whatever reason, and again, we could talk about historical racial abuse and things like that, um, that can have massive outcomes. But that's a trick, you know, massive negative outcomes. But that I would argue is something that it's not the system that's at fault there there's like a subcultural or a social issue there that needs to be tweaked but the system itself is innocent at least in that to that extent in that regard um if you want to come back on that you can do um but there we are well with respects to that so setting aside so the victim culture mentality like the idea that um the idea that uh, an expectation that the system is biased against you keeps people from trying as hard as they can we can set that to the side that argument, its existence, doesn't disprove the existence of the thing they're complaining about, right? I mean, you could potentially say the system is quite racist against you, but you must you must push forward in spite of that. You mustn't let that get you down. So would you argue then you acknowledge there are these biases, these these systemic problems? The issue is the way people respond to it often leads to the perpetuation of those problems, maybe? <laughs> Yes. Um, the only thing is, is again, when we talk about systemic issues, um, we have to bear in mind that because I, I don't, I reject the idea that the West is run um, is governed by white supremacy. That's another argument that I've heard, and I'm not comfortable with it at all. Again, if I'm wrong, I will concede that point. But I'm not comfortable with the idea that the, the world, the Western world, is run for whites and whites only. I just don't buy it. Um, when you talk about systemic issues, I mean, we've already, we've already mentioned it today. You're American. I'm British. Uh, two separate systems. Yes, we have a shared history because one country spawned the other. So yeah, of course, we're connected. Um, was it um, two people divided by a common language, as George Bernard Shaw once put it? Um, but uh, yeah, the, the trouble is, I don't know what system you're referring to, because America, as I say, has got its own unique history. You've, the United States has its own yeah. unique history of racist abuse. And Britain has too. I mean, I, I say this to people. My um, My grandfather, who died when I was 10, good riddance, bastard, uh, used to say, I'm not racially prejudiced. I hate all the bastards equally. Um, he never met a black person he liked, really. He had no time for them at all. Um, and when he died, I was actually quite relieved because he was a thug. And uh, that man spent most of his life as a constable in the London Met. He was a police officer. So when people say to me about, you know, racist, talk to me about racist cops in the UK and things like, or in America, I go, yeah, I can well believe it. I can well believe it because my grandfather was one of them. Um, they always say I don't, that too, I, don't they? The whole, you know, exactly. I hate everyone equally thing. They never really yeah. do, do they? They say that a lot. No. They never really they do. Have, they have, they have, they might hate everybody. Well, they might hate everybody, but they have some that they hate more. They have favorite. A little, bit, little bit of a playing in favor. Yeah, it's like, you know, I mean, they're all, they're all sort of kind of shifty, but that one there, he's definitely, yeah, exactly. So I, when people talk about like racists in the police, I can totally buy it. I mean, and as I say, and I have like, I didn't, I don't know any stories. I don't know if my grandfather got up to anything. And frankly, I don't want to know. Um, but yeah, so when people say things like that, I can believe it. But again, we're talking about two separate systems. Well, you know, um, but the trouble is with critical race theory, again, how it's described and implemented is that it's used universally as though there were no differences between the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, in fact, I've mentioned this to, because I mean, this is how seriously I take this topic. Um, my place of work, I work for a bank in the UK. 
um, my paper was of work is introducing critical race theory into its diversity and inclusion training. And I've written letters to um, a couple of people who are running it, who are like chief operations officers and things like that, saying, I'm not saying you can't do this. I'm just saying that I have my doubts because a lot of this stuff is American and it just doesn't translate. So again, I'm sort of wandering away from the point there. So feel free to wind me back in. But to, you know. Right. So, so to this point, there are a couple of things that I've written down here. Um, so there are a couple of preconditions that we have to set before we can really talk about like the fundamentals in this issue. Obviously, I'm not as familiar with the particulars of racism in the UK, though I imagine that many of them are fundamentally similar because most of when people talk about white supremacy, they're not actually referring to, well, you said the West isn't governed by white supremacy, which is yeah. a statement that I think a person could write an entire book proving or disproving um, yeah. if, if they wanted to. I think when we talk about systemic racism or white supremacy, I try not to talk about intent necessarily, because while it is certainly the case that there are men like your grandfather or, hey, like my grandfather on my father's side, not the living one, thank God, um, or many other men who I know and have known or read about, there are plenty of racist people out there, certainly. Um, yeah. But one of the components of white supremacy is the complete absence of necessary intent. So for example, like, you know, we've talked about this, history has effects on the present. If black people have, were slaves for the first 200 years of this country's existence, and then were second class citizens for the next 120, they are not going to have the same time to build the generational wealth that say their white counterparts might have. It's a mathematical certainty. Even if every, even if when uh, they had signed, you know, the, in the, the Civil Rights Act, even if they had somehow psychically obliterated racism from the minds of every American, but yeah. kept all the economic systems intact as they were, black yeah. people would still be massively behind because only then would they suddenly have the ability to do all these things that white families have been using to compound wealth and power for hundreds of years prior. So one of the issues is that it feels like we're, we're shadow boxing against an invisible enemy, like a ghost of the past. Because mm -hmm. when we talk about like, well, why are black people this way in say Detroit or Chicago, you know? Well, a lot of it is just because of redlining, but it's not because anyone today is necessarily keeping their foot down on the scales. It's an active effort to address pre-existing biases. And that's one of the reasons why this equity thing keeps coming up, you know? If you have a race where one person got to start 20 seconds earlier, you can you can remove any possible restriction from the second you know participant in that race. They will still never catch up, assuming nothing horrible happens to the first one. Some effort mm -hmm. has to be made to even out the game to make things fair which is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of reparations. Again, this is very much a country specific thing, but here yeah. in the United States, a lot of social damage is done from the disparity between black and white people, not just from black people being poor, but from the fact that there's a dissonance socially between those two groups. It leads to a lot of social infighting, a lot of bitterness and resentment. It leads to certain parts of our cities being underkempt, certain parts of our educational systems underfunded and it means that there's going to be a permanent racial bias to the workplace distribution in these cities because i mean if all the worst schools are in black neighborhoods and the best ones are in white neighborhoods if black families have less money than white families on average of course the white people are going to get the tech job education it has nothing to do with any individual teacher being racist they could be totally they could have affirmative action programs if they wanted it wouldn't change all the underlying mathematics so what critical race theory, you said it came from Harvard, and that's right. It was originally a legal study, uh, which rejected the notion that there was racial ambivalence in the practice and the execution of law. And one mm -hmm. of the fundamental presuppositions that people, that legal scholars had relied on beforehand was the idea that unless, unless laws were specifically targeting people based on race, there wasn't really a racial component to them. They were neutral or ambivalent beforehand. But there's an example I'd like to provide, if I may, uh, before I yeah. hand things off to you again. Um, yes. In North Carolina, there was a voter identification law that was proposed, uh, passed, and then challenged by the state Supreme Court. And it was a set of laws that were designed to ban the use of certain types of identification while voting and made adjustments to all of the parameters surrounding voting, how much time you had to do it, like how many weeks beforehand you could do mail-in voting. And... There was nothing racial about this law, mind. It never mentioned white or black people at all. But it was found by the state Supreme Court upon challenge that all of the changes that were made specifically targeted the types of ID that black people were most likely to use, specifically targeted the types of um, 
uh, parameters that black people were disproportionately likely to use. The Supreme Court ended up deciding that the state legislators had targeted black people with, and this is their words, surgical precision, without ever mentioning race. And this is one of these, 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 these shadows that I feel like we have to fight against, because it's entirely possible to create, promote, and perpetuate a racial bias without ever actually mentioning race. So you have to go beyond that. You have to do something a little bit more systemic, assuming, and I see the trepidation there, assuming you don't do so in a way which uh, cripples or harms or otherwise disadvantages people who are already in the majority group. Because I wouldn't, I, it's, it's not about breaking one kneecap to match the pace of the second runner. It's about setting things in motion to undo historical biases. Right. Well, that's a great phrase that you've just used. It's not about breaking one kneecap to reduce the, the, the running speed of the first person. That, that's absolutely true. You talk about, I mean, I'm, I'm going to pick this up because I think in actual fact, we're, we're actually closely aligned on this. I mean, this is the, I'm genuinely surprised by this. It's actually quite scary. Um, we talk about generational wealth. I agree that if you've been a slave, for two, you know, if, you're, if your people have been a slave, slave for 200 years and then been uh, pressed for 100 years, et cetera, et cetera, you don't have the time to generate uh, to create generational wealth and pass it down. But I would argue that certainly in the UK, and I'm guessing it's true in the United States as well, because it's all about money in your part of the world, um, that uh, you, you most pink people have not had the ability to generate great wealth and pass it down to their children and their grandchildren. Most people in the West certainly in the UK, and I'm guessing in the US, are living what you would say, as you would say, paycheck to paycheck. We say pay slip because we're foreign and weird. Um, but again, so there's no real wealth to pass down. Um, in fact, uh, one study, I forget where it was from, said that if you do create great wealth, your family creates great wealth, most of it will be lost within three generations. So the idea that, you know, if you make a lot of money, they say in the early 1800s, that it will somehow be transmitted down through the ages to 2021. Numbers don't add up on that one. So generational wealth, I think, it, yes, there is. A, I can imagine that it's true for some people, but it's not, again, for all whites. It just isn't, uh, I would suggest. Uh, lack of bias in law. Uh, that's where you say critical race theory came from. Um, again, I believe it. Um, but of course, people are flawed. People have, uh, what do they say? Is it unconscious bias is the phrase that goes around a lot uh, that needs to be checked. Um, that's why you have professional um, uh, professional oversight committees to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen. Uh, you talk about the voter ID law in North Carolina. Now, now, that is specific, and I can't challenge that particular example because I don't know anything about it. Um, but you say that we should, um, you say that it has a racist impact, even though race is never explicitly mentioned. And so you say that we ought to do something systemic to fix it. I'm not sure that you can. And the reason is because I'm always concerned with the uh, I'm always concerned with the impact and how it is received, how your solution is received by the wider population, because we're, we're drifting, I think, into the realm of quotas. You know, you might have heard, um, it's certainly in the UK, um, employers are now have to employ, I think it's at least 20% BAME, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic Employees and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you, things like this to try and deal with um, bias in, a, in human resources departments and things like that. Um, this not only creates resentment, I'm not sure it actually fixes the problem at all. Like if you if you're a racist and you are a hardcore racist, you really don't like people who don't look like you. Being surrounded by people who don't look like you isn't necessarily going to cure you of your racism. But more importantly, while it might benefit those individual people who've got a job, which is which is good for them, they've got income, et cetera, et cetera. Does it actually do anything to deal with the wider, as you as you would put it, the wider systemic issues that affect different minority groups? I would argue not much, if anything, if any anything at all. So yeah, I mean, I don't know what you're supposed to, I'm going to just drop that there and hope that you could do something with it. But I mean, as I say, I don't think that it, the trouble with critical race theory is I don't think it actually works. I don't I don't think it's going to have the positive impact that the theorists, the fans of the theory are seeking, truthfully. So with regards to critical race theory, I mean, it's really just a lens of analysis more so than it is a set of prescriptions. So I don't know if it relates to the solutions one would find. But you mentioned the voter ID law, and for me, the solution to that would be fairly simple, a universal identification system in America that's handed out to free for, uh, for free to everyone. Most other countries, most Western democracies have this. America doesn't, for some reason, 
meaning that ID requirements change depending on the state, their accessibility, the time it takes to actually get them. All of them can vary, but I wouldn't have a problem with voter ID laws if a uh, free voter education was passed out to everyone. Likewise, there are changes that we can make to the funding of school districts. Um, the fact that schools are funded based on the property taxes of the houses in that district, that perpetuates a lot of problems. Because, I mean, if you live in a super wealthy neighborhood, your school does not need like that much money. It just, it just doesn't. It's not contributing to the education. Past a certain point, you're just buying. You're, I, I know this. I grew up in Beverly Hills. We had a, a brand new science. You've not heard of that place. Yes. We had a brand new science building and then they built the new football thing and our 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 our, our gym had a basketball a court that turned into a pool because the floor why opened like the Red Sea. It was and and we're I'm I'm only I'm only right next to Koreatown. There are kids who had to grow up in the Los Angeles school district. Um and their schools were just these I mean I don't want to be too evocative or anything, but the distribution of wealth as it stands right now was entirely superfluous in my neighborhood, and it was very destructive to the lives of many other people. Stuff like that. Now, I, I guess you could, maybe this is handicapping the wealthy a little bit. I guess I would say it's to an acceptable extent, but what most people talk about when they talk about addressing these biases, affirmative action, I'm not actually a tremendous fan of it, mostly because in America, affirmative action mostly benefits white women. That just seems to be the group that overwhelmingly and disproportionately benefits. And as a proud misogynist, bad. yeah, I, I, it's just not a group that I want, you know, benefit. That was a joke. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. When it comes to addressing these solutions, right, we need to find ways not to kick resources from one can to another, but to find ways to uh, unite everyone around a solution that everyone benefits from equally. I think that a universal ID system is good for that. I think that public transportation in, um, in large cities is also good for that because it makes it way, 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 way easier to get around if you can't afford to own a car, which in America costs about 9,000 a year on average to own between payments uh, to the lease, to gas, to damage, to insurance. Yep. Um, yep. It, there are so many ways that you can infrastructurally build our society up. And by doing so, you raise the floor, you raise the minimum level. And these yeah. aren't necessarily racially targeted programs either. I'm not saying like we go to every city and like every black person gets a $10,000 check. I'm saying that in neighborhoods which have, we have ignored for so long. You don't just give black people something, but you fix the things that have kept them from getting it for themselves. Because I do believe in individual attainment, as long as we live you know, in, in an economy where people's success is determined in large part by their access to these resources, we should make sure everyone has equal access to those resources. And I believe that if you do that, you get equity in the end. That if you have a country where everyone, regardless of race or whatever, where they are all basically equidistant to the necessary social resources to achieve prosperity, you would get basically the same outcomes across populations, ideally. And the last thing I'll say is this, with regards to white people also experiencing poverty, it seems to me like a lot of your criticisms of, of what I guess gets referred to as critical race theory, you're almost advocating for third wave feminist intersectionality which I think is extraordinarily based because it's something that I support. Your argument is that it is, it is myopic and limiting to only think of social problems at the racial intersection because there are many poor white people. Um, and going further than that, there are ways in which um, people are disadvantaged along other lines that they may not necessarily like. For example, all the ways in which men get fucked over in modern society that like feminists tend not to talk about. These are things that intersectionally can be addressed. The recognition that we're all a product of all of these um, combining and intersecting social issues that describe, not us as people, you know, people are too complicated for that, but they describe a lot of the issues that we face. Um, mm -hmm. I'm autistic, for example, and, you know, I, you, I'm sure you can tell with my, uh, my phenomenal uh, candor here, but um, there, there are some issues there with regards to... Um, to how I like deal with things, but they're like directly affected by the fact that I'm a dude as well. If I was a woman to be totally different, you know, mm -hmm. and to talk about autism as something that would only affect like guys, like maybe there are women who would disagree with that. Or if I were to talk about it in ways that would only necessarily affect like young people, as opposed to people like myself in my late twenties, then you would miss mm -hmm. out on that element as well. It's all about understanding the ways in which these things interact. And I think 
if you agree with that, if you agree that's something worth taking into consideration, you would probably agree with me on almost all of my social prescriptions. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, uh, I, I obviously market myself as a consumer. You're right. Uh, I obviously market myself as a conservative because in British terms, I am. I'm a card carrying member of the Conservative Party. I have voted conservative. But in American terms, people call me, refer to me as a dirty liberal um, because a lot of my positions are very much liberal minded, like, for example, gay marriage, gay adoption and things like that. I don't you know, support these things. Um, One nation conservatism, as advocated by Benjamin Disraeli back in the 19th century, um, stipulates that the government should be responsible for getting the basics at the beginning and then getting out of the way of human beings so you you vosh or james who's moderating and sitting there quietly keeping to himself uh you obviously um you need to know the basics you need to be able to read write and count you need to be able to you will we'll prepare the basics. and then the government steps out of the way and then if james is lazy or if james is not as talented as vosh or whatever then he achieves less than vosh but the difference is is that it's your personal attributes and your personal industry that determines your success in the world so but the thing about america and this is something again that i genuinely did not know i i I was like the fact that your schools are funded by property taxes is ridiculous i mean in the uk it doesn't work like that every single child in the state system receives through the school because it's not directly of course a certain amount of uh, several thousand pounds every year that covers things like textbooks um teaching equipment that sort of thing maintenance of the school to make sure that every child regardless of background if they go to a state school, they're covered. Now, obviously, if you go to a private school, you do what you like. There's a the funding situation is different, but the British culture very much is based on the idea that we we look after you at the beginning, we make sure that everyone gets the same start, and then we step out of the way to let you succeed and fail um, as you see fit. So the American system, as far as I can tell, doesn't work. Like for example, um, your public transport system. Uh, do you have one? Uh, or lack thereof, yeah. Or the lack thereof, yeah. I mean, I live in Manchester in northwest England, which has the busiest bus network in Europe, and it, you, you don't need a car. Owning a car is actually a disadvantage because you can't park the bastard. You can't drive anywhere because the roads are chocker. So you have to go and take the bus or the tram or something like that to go to work. And it works. You know, in, in, and as you've pointed out, you save a fortune on car maintenance because you don't need to maintain a vehicle and you can still get to work the same time it would take you to if you drove a car. So that, things like that, I actually I agree with. Um, I forgot what the next bit, next bit was. You said something about um, Blast. My mind's fallen apart. You said something else and I've forgotten. That doesn't <laughs> help. Blast. What was the next bit? Well, let's just say you agreed with it then, you know, for the sake of charity. Well, no, I mean, well, I'm not, I'm not going to say I agree with Vosh on absolutely everything. Uh, you know, king of the lefties. No, 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 that's not going to happen. Oh, that's very um, kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> well, no, it wouldn't be, no, it wouldn't be king, because I'm, I'm guessing you're not a royalist, so you'd be, like, uh, chief citizen of the lefties. No, I'll, t- no, I'll uh, take it. I'll take it. Thank you. I'm very flattered. Um, but no, uh, but no, th- so there are little bits and pieces like that. But, um, uh, oh, what was I going to say? You said something about um, Paul White. And I can't remember what it was. Could you remember? Can you remind me? Yes, I, think you're, I think you're advocating for intersectionality. It may well be the yes, case that yes. he, here in America, black people are poorer on average than white people. But it's not like white people as a group are doing phenomenally, you know, because they're certainly no. not. We're, we're all, people no. are struggling all around. So it's not just then about black issues versus white issues. It's about which issues make the most people put the most people in the worst position they can be right now. And what do you do to solve them? in a way that addresses the root, the cause, rather than just, like, pastes over a certain group's expression of that problem, you know? Just giving money away does not fix any of these issues. No, it doesn't. And when you, you talked about reparations as well, um, obviously, rep- if, if, your rep- if your idea of reparations is a handout, then I don't support it, because handouts don't solve anything. Because once you've spent the money, it's gone. Um, but if you invest the money, if you invest reparation money in something that could benefit lots of people, people who are disadvantaged, that's fine. Um, the problem is, and you've just stumbled on it, uh, the, the point I was going to make about it is that, as you've said, it is myopic to look at these issues as a purely racial one. Because, of course, there are, as, as you might, there might be black people living in shacks wherever in, in, the, in the country, but they're also, but most of the people who live in shacks in your country are pink, and they also suffer disadvantage. So the way that critical race theory, or whatever it is, I mean, maybe it's not critical race theory, maybe it's a bastard form of it, the way it's used in pop culture, the way it's discussed online, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it stokes up ethnic and racial resentment. So I would, that's, why, that's why I object to it, at least as it's 
propagated because it creates more problems than it solves and it exacerbates the existing problem. Um, I, I've heard, read, you, I'm sure you've been on TikTok, you've been on YouTube, you've seen creators, black and white, mainly non-white actually, who are basically basically espousing a form of ethno-nationalism this kind of, yeah. you, know, black, you know, sort of like, you know, blacks to get a, a kind of pan-African universal blackness that transcends the white man's borders. And I get a lot of this on TikTok and I've responded to a lot of TikTok videos. I think at least I have, I've at least commented on them where they say things like, you know, if you're a black person and you date a white person, you're betraying your race and all this bullshit. And I say, if I said that about whites, you'd call me a Nazi. I mean, with good cause. I mean, what, what, and but yet it's it's given a pass because it, well isn't Jim Crow and slavery awful? Yeah, Jim Crow and slavery were awful, but that's no excuse for whatever this toxic nonsense is. Um, but that's what you're getting. I mean, you've you've had the misfortune of interviewing uh, possibly Britain's worst export, um, Carl Benjamin, aka Sargon of a Cat. You know, Britain's first finest twat. Um, you know, I mean, I thought Piers Morgan was terrible, but Jesus, uh, you've had and again. It, the, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, mean, I shouldn't confess this. Maybe he he soft pedals a lot of stuff. That I mean, it's superficially, right? He thinks they things like I believe in democracy. I am a free speech absolutist. So am I. I'm a free speech absolutist. I think everyone when, should be when you speech. talk so, to him for a bit, it starts coming out though. This, it's just yeah, like... well, this is this is the thing. I actually owe you a favor because I was a subscriber to his YouTube channel. And I agreed with a lot of the superficial stuff, like people should be allowed to speak their minds. Yeah, yeah, they should. That's right. Um, they should be, you know, democracy should be upheld. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. But then you start digging into it. And when you've, you've interviewed him like a couple of times and you go, yeah, actually, there's something, there's more going on here, isn't there? There's, there's, there's a subtext that I didn't know. Pardon yeah. my interruption, but just because Sargon's not here, I w I'm happy to set you guys up. But just because he's not here to defend himself, I do want to redirect more. Oh, okay, okay. No, uh, wrong, no, no, but... no, fair enough. No, I well, I will stop. The point I'm making is, is that if you get um, black nationalists, if you get black racists, anti-white black racists, right, you are going to get a white response. And it's a response to this kind of thing. Now, I guys, again, I can't speak for America. I'm not going to. That's your shop, right? I can speak for Britain, and I can sort of flirt with the wider European continent. You must have noticed this from across the pond, because you've got fingers in various pies. You know that not only is Britain drifting to the right, which mild conservatism, obviously, I'm in favour of, because that's basically like classical liberalism now, but you go on the continent, it's a shit show. You've got Le Front National in France, Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, Golden Dawn, whatever that is in Greek. Uh, the, the fascists are gaining Italy and Spain and Portugal. There's a kind of a kind of a sort of weird uh, hard right rena renaissance, and it's tapping into white resentment uh, or kind of um, a backlash against poorly handled. I would argue poorly handled critical race theory. It's like, well, all these black people are complaining about they're not getting this, this, and this. I haven't got that either. But they say that I'm benefiting from uh, white supremacy and this sort of thing. And that, but, but I get nothing. So, and this guy comes along, whoever he happens to be, mentioning no names because James has told us off because we're being naughty. Um, <laughs> but you know, but is that, and they're, they're, this is the market. They're tapping into this shit. It's like this stuff. You need to you need to pick on this. And I, I consider that a failure of the left. The right is picking, the far right, which obviously I don't represent, but the far right is just mopping up the traditional left-wing vote, the sort of disenfranchised, disillusioned working class. And that, I think, is, you know, it, that's where this could go. Uh, it could go, we could lose it all because it's if this issue is poorly handled. Okay, so there are, there are a few things, actually quite a few things that I have to say here. My God, okay, so... You're an advocate for meritocracy, which I think is almost a utopian ideal that I share, the idea that, you know, we get what we deserve. I mean, it's almost self-fulfilling, right? You would hope. Um, well, I'm not, I would disagree with the idea that I'm utopian because I gave up on utopia years ago. Well, the, but, ho uh, the, the hope that, like, we could live in a society where people truly benefit from the fruits of their labor and their talents to, a, to an extent which is perfectly determined by the extent to which they try and so on and so forth. It's wor I mean, it's certainly something that I think is worth pushing towards. There will always be some biases. This person had a better family growing up than this person or that, but I mm -hmm. think it's a good thing to believe in, if nothing else. It's just, you said something that I like, you know, the government should set things up at the beginning. So, yeah, I'm probably more in favor of government involvement than you are generally, at least 
for yeah, now, probably. because down the line, I'd think myself an anarchist. But at least for the moment, of course, the degree to which you set something up. <laughs> oh, you say you like low level, uh, low levels of government involvement. Then I've got an ideology for you. Well, regardless where we live now, <laughs> um, where you set the line on the government setting things up is pretty arbitrary. So right now you get K through 12 in the United States. You know, the government mm -hmm. will pay for that. That's your right. Uh, but college, of course, college is quite expensive. It's been getting quite a bit more expensive with time, too. And now people are arguing, well, basically, in order to get any kind of job beyond line cook, you need to have a college degree anyway. Maybe that should also be something that the government sets up for you, that you get for free. Not so much because, you know, we deserve more now than we did back then, but because there's more social utility to be derived from that being considered a baseline and what used to take place. Because back, you know, uh, 50, 60 years ago, finishing high school was way more of an accomplishment than it is today, like proportionally mm. speaking. If you finished high school, you were like a strong, like robust, you know, you were educated. You could, and if, going to college, like, my God, brain lords, you know, these eggheads yes. going to college. Nowadays, yeah. going to college and getting a bachelor's degree is practically a prerequisite for anything worthwhile. So maybe as the economy grows more technologically dependent, the line shift forward and the only point I'm making is that what it takes to set things up, where you draw that line is arbitrary, because it could have been that maybe in America, it's only elementary school the government pays for, and that high school is something that's always privately dictated or always needs to be paid for, and all the wealthy people would get their high school and all the poor people wouldn't, and we would just have to settle for that. Obviously, we didn't go with that, but we took it a step further, but there's no hard line. It's always what you get the most utility from. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, as, uh, speaking as a former teacher, well, I'm still a qualified teacher, I just don't do it anymore. Um, I, I believe that what you're actually describing is academic inflation. Um, it used to be the case in the UK, at least, that you could leave school at 14 with no qualifications, then at 16 with GCSEs, then at, then with, at 18 with A-levels. Um, it used to be the case that only 2% of school leavers got a degree. Now it's 32%. So getting a degree doesn't make you more employable. Getting a master's is almost entirely pointless. You know, but most employers in the UK, at least, will take a BA with a year's worth of practical work experience over than an MA with no work experience. Um, so, I mean, I think Bill Maher on real time, I don't agree with everything he says, but he actually talks about college. It's the fact it's not so much making college more accessible. It's about making college more unnecessary. Um, you don't want to spend, I mean, because in America, again, I've had a chat with Stephen Ryan of the YouTube channel, Cider and Port, sorry, I'm just promoting his channel again, because uh, I don't have one, I've got nothing else to promote. Um, yes, uh, we had a chat about this, it's basically college in your country is a grift. It's a fucking grift. There's no way on God's green earth that an English degree from Brown is worth, what, $20,000 a year. It just isn't. I mean, my student debt is, is almost negligible. Um, I've got a degree in English and American literature, um, but it didn't cost me the earth, and I wouldn't have paid for it if it cost me the earth. But then I only needed that degree to become an English teacher. I The idea that everybody should go to college or that college should be free, I disagree with, because... It's, um, I mean, you're, we're talking about economics again, but it's scarcity that breeds value. So if everybody's got a degree, or if more people get degrees, shall we say, get degrees, shall we, shall we say, it reduces the remarkability? No. Notability? Respectability? Mm, I don't know. Yeah, it right. reduces the respectability of a degree. So it's not about giving you access to everything. It's about reducing the need for some access. So they're sort of redirecting funds and resources to other areas and hoping that that will... Uh, One of the problems Even though we're discussion. slightly off topic, if you disagree, Vosh, because I have a feeling you might... Oh, yeah, we, I'll, bring it, I'll bring it back to the line. You. Right. The only, the only point I'm making vis-a-vis -vis meritocracy is that we always have to consider what we think the starting line should be and where it is, you know? The starting line used to be, you know, living out in a peasant village... Um, and nowadays, the starting line includes like a bevel of education and healthcare rights, at least somewhere mm -hmm. in the world, um, that we wouldn't have expected 300 years ago, but today do. With regards to education, of course, there are so many problems with the way we treat modern education that talking about it and its necessity feels like a, a, a maelstrom. I know that here in the United States, it's still generally beneficial to get a college degree and the payout you get eventually, but there's no denying the system is absolutely fucked as it stands. One way or another, with the meritocracy thing aside, What's interesting to me, so you talked about black separatism, the idea that there are black people essentially advocating for black ethnostates or using the kind of racist language that is, well, if you were white and you said it, people would call you a white nationalist, and fairly so, so it seems fair to call them the same, though. 
Some of them argue against the term black nationalist and say black separatist or whatever. We understand the idea that we're talking about here. Um, yeah. There are a couple of points to that. First of all, I think it's an entirely separate issue. It certainly has nothing to do with critical race theory because, and I promise you this, critical race theory has nothing to do with like this almost reverse racism advocacy for like far right policies from the other end of the justification spectrum. What would you call it? Woke racism? Whatever that is, I promise yeah. you, nobody's teaching this. What's interesting to me is a lot of what I guess gets called critical race theory by you and by others feels like it fits within the teaching or curriculum of um, Robin DiAngelo. Do you know who that woman is? The, with, yes. With the white privilege. Yes. Book? Right. Yes, I do. So I just I despise this person, but it's not because they push critical race yes. theory. It's, be Sorry. it's because they push liberal progressivism or liberal anti-racism. It's funny to me because I think you actually are advocating for a critical perspective. Critical race theory in the sociological sense is a derivative of critical theory, which is Marxist in nature. But Marxist things, Marxist lens of analyses, always pay due deference to class differences. Critical race theory in the sociological sense necessarily takes into consideration a lot of conditions that Robin DiAngelo does not. So Robin DiAngelo's solution to racism is what? Well, first of all, she's a white business consultant. So first solution to racism is business owners need to hire more white business consultants to tell their white employees <laughs> to be more guilty for being white. Now, I'll, I'll say it. I fairly do. I've read excerpts from these books. They're essentially accused telling white people they need to feel guilty for being white. This is not only not critical race theory, this is fundamentally a rejection of the intersectional values that have defined third wave feminism since what the 90s um yeah i despise them i really do and they poison the well for discourse too because yeah. now i i reject i don't think this is being taught to like every student or like it's this is like defines the entire left-leaning you know zeitgeist on this particular subject but with people like robin d'angelo they're very popular because they are appeal to guilty white people and the people who know they can make money by appealing to guilty white people and there are guilty white people in this country I have never in my life advocated for white people feeling guilty for being white. I have never felt guilty for being white. I am of the belief that we should be entirely responsible for and proud of our own personal actions, what we've done, what we've overcome. I don't think I've ever done slavery, so I don't feel a need to feel bad about that personally. Um, but with the Robin D'Angelo types, it's there's this complex grift in like the 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 corporate like in the corporate market where they. They know racism is a hot button issue and they know they want to insulate themselves against HR complaints. So they want to get hot button names like like Robin D'Angelo to like talk as consultants on their company because they, they hear that's like the modern way of addressing racism. Robin mm -hmm. D'Angelo makes money by telling people that she needs to be hired to tell them how to address <laughs> racism. It's a circle. Like, I don't even know what to say about it, but it's not critical race theory, I promise you. If Robin D'Angelo was to present her work in any kind of like structured academic setting 99 times out of 100 they would be picked apart by people in the sociology or the criminal justice studies field well, i promise I, you they would tear her apart sorry i'm, I'm going to, sorry I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting i'm going to leap on this james uh, mm -hmm. but probably bad form but there we are um i you I, I am so relieved that you don't like white fragility the book that has sold yeah. like several million copies because I, um, because this is the stuff that's being introduced in my place of work and it's being sold as critical race theory. Um, Robin, and I'm not talking about Robin D'Angelo, James, because I don't know her, I've never met her, but her book, White Fragility, is probably the most terrifying book I read in 2019. And as someone who is addicted to horror fiction, that's impressive. Um, the way she tackles these topics, again, is myopic. Uh, but she only looks at it through a racial lens. Um, like, for example, uh, she was talking about one of the examples in the book Book. Um, I don't know how much I've read the whole thing cover to cover. I've given copies to people to say read this and laugh or cry, depending. Um, but when I uh, one of the examples she says like Hollywood movies uh, propagate negative stereotypes of black people, um, like Donkey in Shrek. Right? I went, hang on. Donkey was played by Eddie Murphy. It does very well. He's a comic actor. Makes sense. But when I was a kid and I watched Shrek, I didn't go, hmm, Donkey acts like all black people. Therefore, this is what black people... That's, who thought that? I certainly didn't. And I don't know anybody who did. But Fishing that's the kind examples. of... Say again? Fishing for examples. Or, exactly. Or, or self-reporting, too. Because what... I don't... 
I know. I mean, I know he's played by. I don't think of Donkey as black. I've never in my life no, even. I took no, me a second no, when you said no, that. No, because like, he reflect. does. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Nobody does. But this is the sort of thing that's being marketed. And it's this is the stuff that's infecting the workplace. In fact, the first letter, and it is a letter that I wrote to the people running the diversity and inclusion training, was a review of white fragility. Because at the end of the first webinar, that, or you know, online seminar, you know what webinar is, come on. Um, the first webinar that I attended, there was a recommended reading list with people like Robin DiAngelo, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, Adam Rutherford, who wrote a book called How to Argue with a Racist. And I said, as someone who's read like all of those books and has a pit thoughts and feelings on all of them, white fragility should not be should not be read by anyone who's keen to fix the problem because it's such a dreadful book. It, it creates more problems than it solves. But this is the stuff that's being propagated. I mean, yeah, you say in a structured academic setting, um, this wouldn't be respected as critical race theory. I have no way to verify that. I must assume that it's but true. I wanna, but I want to. I want to affirm that because what you're what, what you're discussing right now, these the problems with this book, the problem with these ideas, is there actually a fundamental rejection of the modern ideological trends, not only among sociologists and leftists, but among critical race theory activists, in large part because Robin DiAngelo is a fucking liberal first and foremost. All of these criticisms exist as they do because they don't want to address class. That's one of the fundamental problems with like second wave feminist discourse or like more liberal leaning anti-racist <laughs> advocacy, which leads you to to what? Uh, to Kamala Harris's, you can get a, your student loans paid off if you go to an underserved neighborhood for three years, the Pell Grant fund thing. If you Did you hear about I, that? I don't, I know nothing about it. Sorry, I can't it's, comment. It's these obscene ways of brushing at the fringes of systemic racism without addressing class issues, which means you can't do it. It's not really possible. I mean, so many of the ways in which racism reiterates itself in modern society is through the economic structures that get used in ways that without specifically addressing race, nonetheless reflect racial outcomes. This, the Robin DiAngelo, I mean, um, uh, here, a fundamental uh, 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 point to the stuff that she writes, a complete rejection of intersectional analysis is this, that white people need to look internally and always reflect upon, you know, the ways in which their prenatal biases or just internalized biases and contradictions can reflect in racism in their behavior, right? But mm -hmm. it's commonly accepted. I think almost everyone believes this, at least in the academic circles that I was a part of and in leftist groups that I'm a part of, too. It's not just white people. Internalized racism can exist within or against absolutely any group. If you're black, you can absolutely internalize points of our culture that lead you to hold and reflect beliefs against black people. This is like 101 stuff, for example. And you can say it goes against white people sometimes, too. But the fact that Robin DiAngelo won't even touch on the idea that people who are not white can hold these biases that will also reflect in negative ways against non-white people means that her priority is not addressing racism. Her priority is grifting money out of guilty liberal whites. That is her number one priority. That is, it, I find it repulsive, frankly. I think that it's a, a rejection not only of the things she claims but to support, is, but it makes my job harder. This is genuinely delightful because this is I, I did I genuinely thought we were going to disagree on this issue because again and I'm not going to try to talk about Robin DiAngelo specifically because I don't know her but um, true liberals and true conservatives are united in one respect at least one respect we we believe in the sovereign sovereignty of the individual and the trouble with the way and again forget the academic setting because I don't know anything about it, the way that CRT is propagated in the modern world in the West, it's, they're encouraging us to think racially. They want us to be racially conscious and racially blind at the same time. This is why, when you remember when I opened my, my opening remarks were, I object to CRT because it's collectivist. Um, this is where I think a lot of um, a lot of this stuff falls down. My politics were largely shaped by studying the Holocaust, visiting Auschwitz, things like that. That's what I'm worried about. That's what I fear whenever we talk about race, we talk about um, racial groups going against each other and things like that, or not, not with you specifically, but in general. And so I, that's why I believe, I champion individualism as much as humanly possible. Because Can if I you think that just really quick? Yes. Yeah, no, go for it. I just want to say, it's, it's a matter of reconciling the two, because I believe it's possible to hold in your mind a systemic and collective critique of social systems while also believing in one's individual autonomy within it. The example that I have for this is, so say you're like a poor black guy who grew up in East Los Angeles. I had many such friends when I was growing up. 
it is okay. a virtual statistical guarantee that born into that environment, your life is going to be very difficult and at least economically not very fruitful. It's terrible, but that is just the case. The numbers bear that out and have for generations. Now, I can make that statement confidently talking about the group, but to my individual friends in that environment, did I ever say you should give up? There's not really much of a point. Your environment is set against you. Never said that. Wouldn't either if I could go back and talk to them again, ever, because I'm not a lunatic. It's a matter of understanding that there are systemic critiques, but individual action. Likewise, with the, um, with the Robin D'Angelo thing, she makes the mistake of ascribing broader systemic critiques to individual action and making prescriptive judgments from that. Sure, you can be a white person and you can believe that, um, yeah, maybe with my shitty racist dad, I did internalize some bad stuff. You know, that's a thing you can think of. Like, it's worth thinking about at least. But then walking around constantly thinking of yourself as this agent whose interests are diametrically opposed to your black neighbor, your black landlord, the black friend you have, a thing that you yeah. always have to recognize and be conscious of and apologize for. Not only is that psychotic and exhausting, it's also yeah. a misattribution of your priorities. Individually, you should be kind to the people around you. You should consider yourself and your biases, sure. But as an individual, you and your black neighbor and your black friend, I'm saying you because I'm assuming that you're white. I mean, you're white, I'm white. So yeah, so you and the people around you of different races, your dynamics, your interplay, they're determined by you, your life, your biases, your consciousness. The broader mm -hmm. stuff comes into, into, the, into the, 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 the scene with broader critiques. Um, and I think that you can maintain both of those without undermining the individualism, because I, I very much believe in the importance of individualism. It's one of the reasons why I'm so keen on getting rid of these systemic biases, because nothing undermines individualism than the near sociological guarantee that a group of people are fucked from birth because of the zip code that they're born into. Nothing, mm -hmm. nothing subverts it harder than being able to look at a person's like driver's license and know with almost absolute certainty what economic class they're a part of. That is anti-individualism. So to achieve that, that, you know, <laughs> the dream of true individual autonomy, I feel like the mm -hmm. only way to do that is to be simultaneously conscious of, but also sort of deferential to some of these systemic problems all i'll say is that i think about systemic issues regarding race a lot but i i just don't think about it when i'm hanging out with people in my life who are like of different races or genders or whatever i just i never think of it when i'm interacting with them i think of them yeah. and myself as individuals and then when i'm sitting here i'm thinking of things i guess in a broader sense because it feels more prescriptively useful when talking about stuff like policy you know Mm. Well, no, but this is where um, I think the, the difference between you and me is, I mean, you want to talk about, you know, being born in a certain zip code determines your future. I'm from the UK. We have a deeply entrenched class system and have had it for almost a thousand years. Um, it's I don't have any hope that you can fix it. You know, if you are born into what you call it a housing project, I would call it a council estate. If you're born and raised there, the chances of you becoming prime minister are, well, it's, there is no chance. Um, so I'm afraid I don't, I don't, where we disagree, uh, I don't believe you can fix systemic issues, to use that phrase. Um, what I, so yeah, so we champion individualism, we try to liberate as much as possible, but ultimately there is going to be a hierarchy of some type, kind, and it's not going to be entirely fair. Uh, so I don't think you can fix it entirely. Um, you talk about obviously not walking around with this sort of psychotic obsession with um, you know how you interact with other people. Again, that's the sort of thing that's winding people up. And you're right. You're right. I agree with you on that score. Um, you you can't walk around thinking like that because that would be insane. You'd, you'd, you'd go mad. You wouldn't be able to think about anything else. The other thing that also bothers me about all of this talk about racial grouping and things like that is, I mean, I, I as I say, I don't know you personally, Bosch, but you're apparently like Irish and Polish. Polish, is that right? That's all like, like back. Nailed it, yeah. Most people didn't yeah, even Irish know the Polish, Polish right? thing. Yeah, well, they Irish and Polish, right? So those are two white white pink populations. I don't like using white and black because I think they're loaded terms, but you're, those are two pink majority populations that have also experienced colonization and genocide. But because they're, you're pink and therefore not brown, and therefore you can't be, you're seen by a lot of people as, well, you're still white and therefore you're still, and that really winds me up because you think so if the Slavic tribes of Eastern Europe have been slaughtering each other for millennia, the Irish have been occupied, you know, England has occupied Ireland for what, 900 years now with varying degrees of success. I won't dwell on that because Stephen Ryan's probably in the comment section screaming now. Um, but uh, 
you know, and, and of course, Jews, the Ashkenazim of Europe, um, possibly the most persecuted tribe in European history, with the exception of the Roma people. So the idea that pink people can't experience deep issues is, well, actually, it's, I would argue it's racist, but also it's not covered. It's not covered by any of the stuff that I'm reading um, from commentators. And again, I'm not talking about serious academics that you might have talked to, but the way this stuff is being abused in the wider culture. So those groups get shafted because they're not covered by something and they really ought, they really deserve to be covered. Well, the big problem with me, and this actually goes back into a central problem that I have with something earlier that you said that I'll address shortly is, so, okay, two things then. First of all, with regards to how to fix systemic problems like this, you know? We, we do know that we can fix these problems to an extent though, right? The problem is like we try, we, we like, we make essentially no effort to. Right now, Detroit is undergoing a massive urban renaissance as a bunch of the old elements of city architecture are being dismantled in favor of a renewed public transport system, a restructuring of the suburban population, stuff like that. And apparently it's led to an extraordinary increase. Guys, it is Detroit, right? It's not Chicago. It's not Detroit. I, I think it's, right, it's, it's one of those cities. I'm pretty sure it's Detroit. Um, there's been a huge, huge, is it Chicago? It's one of those goddamn cities. Anyway, there's been a huge, they're, they're pulling my leg. Um, there's been a huge uptick in the degree of social mobility, the access to public services on the part of poor people, um, on account of these fundamental civic changes. There are changes we can make to the way our suburbs are designed, our public transportation, the way our IT cards are divvied and the laws we have with regards to voting. All of the, I'm speaking of course here in America, but I know that fundamentally a lot of these problems exist in the UK as well in their own ways. The political system's fairly different, but in terms of infrastructure and public systems and the way the NHS has been privatized to an extent and sort of whittled off over the past few decades, there are ways in which these systems can be addressed. And the autonomy that I'm looking for, the individualism that I'm hoping for is something which is at the end of that tunnel. Yeah a product that we can arrive at after a sufficient amount of investment has been put into making sure a society does allow, I mean, if you want to think of it this way, the wheat to be separated from the chaff, right? We don't really know at the moment because, I mean, here in America, at least, if you're like an upper middle class white person born in the suburbs, you can be an absolute loser and live a life of fair decency and comfort, you know, and uh, get and consume more than a dozen poor people. And you can be an extraordinary, extraordinarily talented young black man who grows up in like East LA and you can get and do and consume nothing and all your intelligence will mean nothing as you're buried in you know, a pauperous grave. It's horrible. If, if we're looking then to the, the, the dream of people's talents being reflected in the lives that they live, this is something that we need to do. Establish a bar, a bottom floor. And we've come so far since the Industrial Revolution. The introduction of social security in this country, Medicare and Medicaid, when they were introduced respectively, led to an extraordinary reduction in the gap of available opportunities and outcomes for people who did previously and didn't um, uh, uh, qualify for those benefits. In short, basically, it closed the gap. There are other programs that have done similarly. Even the war against poverty, you know, Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society, flawed and insufficient as it was, there were noticeable improvements. All of these pay back in the long run, by the way. For example, um, investment in, I think it's WIC, the Women's Infants, uh, it's one of our social programs designed for underprivileged women and children, I think. Um, I believe that it was for every $1 you invest in that program, you pay back $7. Um, you get seven more dollars out of it because it means that fewer unwanted children are getting born. It means that more people have access to healthier food, which means that they don't have as many medical problems down the line. There are a bunch of down the road benefits. Investment in these basic social services leads to huge payouts in the long run if handled and managed effectively. Very often, it's not that the government can't handle these programs. It's that the elected representatives don't want them to because the elected representatives, often the conservative parties, at least here in America, again, different countries, benefit politically from the government's failure because they don't want the groups that are disadvantaged at the moment to reap the benefits of a, you know, a, a positive set of social systems. Or if the government does poorly, that's good for their brand because they sell themselves on the idea that the government doesn't work. So if they don't let the government work, it works fine. You said... Yeah that the far right push is a backlash to critical race theory. And it's certainly true that right now we're getting like this uh, wide swath of that. But as I understand it, the big far right push 
in Europe started to really kick into gear during the migrant crisis. And I think it 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 speaks to uh, there's variance there. That's a very temporal, yeah. you know, you could start it at a number of points. But what it seems to me is that it's true that I'm going to call it very loosely misbehavior on the part of left-leaning people, like all of this black separatist nonsense that I see on TikTok. Misbe yeah. Let's just use misbehavior, I think, in, in a broad term. It's true that it it riles the right up and it gives them a lot to attack. It's very bad optically and it's horrible just in general. But I feel like the right, at least some parts of it, is very, very talented at riling up their constituency no matter what's going on, you know? Like, I mean, they were doing it back in the 60s too, right? I mean, back during the civil rights movement. It's not like they were totally fine with what was going on because there were no crazy elements of what was taking place. They were accusing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of rioting and anti-white violence and being a communist and being in line with the Jews to destroy America and blah, blah. So it, while it's Absolutely. true, there, there are always things the left uh, is doing to make things harder for ourselves. I, I think we have to be very principled in our rejection of reactionary values, even if they seem like to be a product of the behavior of the far left, because there's a very long road you can run down. I mean, after all, not to Godwin's law, but Hitler did say, of course, that what he was doing was justified because the Bolshevik Jewish population was destroying Germany's banks and society with reparations, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, they always try to sell it as some victim thing. It's always, we need yeah. to do this because of X and Y. So it's, I always try to be careful with those narratives because it feels like you could, by, by legitimizing them, you could lead to them justifying quite a bit of bad stuff. Hmm. Well, I mean, you no, know, I agree. So I, agree I rambled for a extent. really long time there, by the way. I'd no, just like to the, apologize. No, God, I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. Um, no, the trouble with them, um, you're right. Uh, there, there are, but to be honest, I would say it's true for both sides. The left and the right love to play the victim card, but it depends It depends on how you're using the playing victim or playing the victim card. Um, there are people on the right who suggest that, you know, Western civilization is coming to an end. Uh, we need to tighten, you know, we need to basically put, uh, put, adopt sort of neo fascistic um, style of, cult, of politics to protect ourselves. I don't buy that at all. Um, I believe in conserving existing institutions. Um, the, the awkward thing with the NHS is that I don't agree that privatizing elements of the NHS is necessarily a bad thing. Um, conservatives are not necessarily hostile to it either. I mean, people forget that Winston Churchill was instrumental in funding, in, in supporting the NHS in its earliest uh, incarnation. People forget that stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so you are right. The back, the the rise of hard right, far right, call it whatever you will, in the European societies is partly to do with a, um, in a response to the migrant crisis, um, particularly in places like Hungary, where they managed to get, was it like 400, 500,000 Syrian refugees cross their borders in about two weeks or something daft, and no country on earth um, certainly a country the size of Hungary can process that many people effectively without there being massive cock-ups and um, general you know, political and social backlash. I mean, it's, it's just normal. Um, but in the Anglosphere, the English-speaking world, a lot of this stuff is in response to critical race theory. Uh, the, the Conservative Party um, issued a report on wokery wokeism or whatever there's obviously the Sewell the Sewell report um with the, from the commission on race and ethnic disparities was called for by Boris Johnson it's not that Dr Sewell is a is a friend of Boris Johnson it doesn't work like that uh, on all the commissioners were most of the commissioners were not pink so they had a vested interest in you know destroying systemic racism but their conclusions were more nuanced and I think that is why the Sewell report has been largely rejected by sort of misbehaving elements of the left to use your phrasing um but yeah i think we need i think it's it, it, the solution is while racism is real i think what we need both sides need to calm down both sides need to come together break bread hold hands in kumbaya or something and try to hash out something that's a little bit more subtle than what is being proposed by people on the winter internet or in wider society because it could go badly wrong um, and it could go badly wrong for people who don't necessarily look like me. So that's my that's my real objection. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, there you go. No, yeah. I just the pro the problem is I I didn't expect you to speak in good faith on this issue. I've spoken to a lot of people whose opposition to critical race theory has been um, uh, uh, very dumb and also has been very um, racially motivated. But there's not any of that in you. So I guess 
I would love to break bread and do the kumbaya thing because I I really like focusing on policies, you know? I feel like mm. a lot of people, especially conservatives nowadays, they hammer in on the economic issues. And that's important because I think that affects people more severely than a lot realize. And also mm. because I feel like we could agree on those like really, really easily. When it comes to stuff like reparations, when I talk about it, I just mean allow our underdeveloped cities to breathe, for God's sake. You know, why are the cities are the way they are? Well, because our uh, governors would rather, our governors and mayors would rather spend money on stadiums to attract, you know, sports teams and publicity rather than spend all that money on repairing their fucking roads or on building new highways or on investing in public transportation and our schools or this and that. It's just about allowing things to be better for people using methods that have tried and proven uh, that, that work. We know they work. Um, but with this critical race theory thing, very often people's opposition to it seems to be a broader opposition of anything that is anti-racist. So your opposition, it, like you talk about like Robin D'Angelo and stuff. And thank God, because I hate Robin D'Angelo. But sometimes people will say that it's, it's critical race theory to teach in schools that America was fundamentally racist when it um, when it was created, which, I mean, I don't know. First of all, I don't know if that's the terminology used in like elementary schools, but I mean, it was it was a slave empire when it was founded, so it seems like it would be a fairly salient criticism to go ahead with one way or another. I, uh, if I can, I can I leap on that. Just sure. I I only um, I only want to say that while again this isn't critical race theory, it's just. So often critical race theory gets invoked as a criticism of like anything progressives say that have anything to do with race. And in that respect, I feel like we have so little to agree on because they push for, oh, you know, in school, you can't teach this or that push for patriotic education. You know, um, now all of our uh, education is doctrinal. Now it's, uh, you know, highly ideologically motivated. I can't agree to stuff like that. But if the agreement were to be things like, you know, we could work together on this project to benefit everyone economically and raise up the disparity a little bit, that would be amazing. I wish we could get along on that. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, uh, I'm leaping onto that for a second. Um, I've read an awful lot of stuff, and this is not, you know, I'm not, you know, hanging out on the dark web. I don't go on naughty websites with swastikas all over the homepage. That's not my, that's not my, uh, my milieu at all. Um, but there is a lot of stuff online that's been released um this stuff like uh you must you must have read this about um talking about like for example in business coca-cola in atlanta where they did a slideshow and one of the sentences was try to be less white and things like that i did a video on that one Oh, you did? Uh, well, so did I. Um, that was actually one of my my first uh, viral hits, was me commenting on this utterly ridiculous, toxic crap. That's that in. was Robert no, D'Angelo, by the way. Oh, was it? Oh, Robert was it? D'Angelo uh, made that PowerPoint. I can't say anything because James will hit me. Uh, right, okay, no... Um, <laughs> Uh, no, the, 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 they're talking about education. The problem is, is that it's being used as a weapon. And this is because of one thing we definitely, definitely, definitely agree on is we don't want to section, we don't want to parcel society off into racial tribes. Because when you've got, I mean, there's always going to be racial tension to some degree. You put two tribes on one patch of land, there's going to be racial tension. It's just going to happen, right? But the trouble with the way this is being used in schools is, yes, your country was indeed... Um, you know, when uh, the genocide, slavery, et cetera, et cetera. My country, you know, we made the fortune out of the uh, slave trade, you know, things like that. I mean, um, municipal buildings in like Glasgow, Bristol, London, they're funded by a lot of slave plantations or plantations that you, you know, use slaves. Um, the problem is, is that I think the, the objection, uh, at least in your country, when it comes to education, is that this, this theory whatever it is, I mean, if it's critical race theory or something else, is being used to encourage people to divide on racial lines and then to turn against each other in a kind of like divide and rule strategy. Um, that's the that's the deep fear that I have. And that sort of stuff is coming into the UK. And uh, for some, because again, they, so they, they ignore all cultural and national nuances. And there is now a backlash to it in British society. Um, people are now a bit worried that their children are being taught this stuff. And I mean, Britain, for all of its flaws, its many, many, many flaws, is one of the most successful multicultural societies in Europe. We lead Europe in terms of interracial marriage. 
um, and things like that. Um, the mayor of London is a British Pakistani, for example. Um, I think we've now got the most diverse parliamentary body that we've ever had. And again, that wasn't by design. That's just because this, it, they, this, this diverse body of politicians reflects wider British society and the mood of the British people. So a lot of this stuff which is cooked up in america doesn't work in america but it definitely doesn't work in britain and it's going to create a lot of tribal conflict is well, again, my concern. keep in mind if we're just talking about like the product of robin d'angelo here it's really just whether or not you know the the federal institutions and the corporations hire her as a consultant or hire people who reflect the kind of language that she uses it's just in black lives matter the movement here in america you know the mm -hmm. marches had hundreds of millions of people. It was the largest civil rights march in the history of this country. Um, you know, there was many thousands of marches, but broadly the movement was enormous and it was also multiracial, you know. The overwhelming ideological, um, uh, the, the overwhelming ideological bent for anti-racists in this country is black, white, brown, Asian, whatever, people working together to address systemic inequality, you know. This... This Robin D'Angelo consultant merchant class, white people need to be constantly walking on tiptoed eggshells to avoid, you know, a microaggression, this stuff. This is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. And the only reason it's blown up to the extent that it has is because of conservative media hyping it up. If left leaning media had the ha controlled the reins on what elements of anti racist discourse were promoted, you would be seeing Black Lives Matter protests, the hundreds of thousands of people marching in New York or Los Angeles in tandem, shoulder to shoulder, black and white, chanting against police brutality. But we don't see those. We got a couple videos of those, maybe. We mostly got videos of a couple of buildings being lit on fire in Portland, you know? And yeah. now we have a literal congressman like Matt Gates accusing the, uh, the um, Joint Chiefs of Staff chairman of being like a woke tool of critical race theorists because he refused to denounce an academic theory of which he, at least to my understanding, had no apparent understanding what it was or what it meant. And now people on the right, including Donald Trump, are calling for his resignation. Now Fox is too. This, this scare, this fear mongering is being driven largely by the right. Like the idea that questions on critical race theory, which at least by your description, I mean, we're largely talking about like consultants in uh, workplaces and their myopic and stupid attitudes towards anti-racism is now being talked about in the highest echelons of our political system. This is absolute madness. And I think that their fear-mongering has gone well, well, well beyond what could be justified based on the behavior of the left-leaning people here. I mean, now we have like military generals being asked their opinion of critical race theory. Like these are, like this is the McCarthy era, you know? Are yeah. you a communist or have you ever known a communist? This is... Yeah. If this was a sane world, this conversation would be either held exclusively in academia, please, or it would, with, so where I don't have to touch it either, or it would be like this, you know, it would be an argument between progressive anti-racists and like liberal anti-racists over the appropriate way to encourage people to, in, you know, address racial issues in the immediate environment they live in. It would not be like governors passing laws preventing the teaching of CRT and the president yeah. calling for the resignation. This is, it's very scary. I am legitimately scared because the McCarthy era was only 70-ish years ago. And I yeah. know very well that from the satanic panic and from Christ, even Jack Thompson, uh, Jack Dorsey, with the video game. Uh, oh, group. yes, yes, I know. Yeah, I know the video. I mean, I'm not a gamer, but I know all of him, yes. He spoke uh, to Congress. Not Jack yeah. Dorsey. That's the sorry, Jack Thompson. Yeah, Jack he's, Dorsey's the, he's the, the head of Twitter, isn't he? Jack Dorsey. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, the no, Twitter, Jack, yeah. Jack something. I know. I know who you're who you're talking about. Though, it was the same with the comics code. Every once in a while, every there's and there's usually something that incites it from the left. But there's this conservative wave of fear mongering from hmm. some kind of radical, subversive, uh, you know, um, anti-American new trend. And hmm. every time that thing that trend is ill-defined it's vaguely conceptualized but it's a systemic existential threat to the world and mm. everything is justified as a response whether it means cracking down on education mass firings in the government like huge fear-mongering campaigns in media that stuff scares me way more than the worst excesses of whatever robin d'angelo writes about you know so that's mm. what i have to focus on 
Maybe I, there are elements of this that are out of line, but that stuff is a legitimate threat to freedom of speech in this country. No, I mean, no, I mean, I understand that obviously passing laws, I mean, as someone who is, as I said before, a free speech advocate, I don't like being, I don't like cancel culture. And I'm one of those people who believes that cancel culture really exists because I've been the victim of it um, in, in mild forms. Um, I don't like laws being passed to censor academic inquiry. That doesn't that doesn't sit right with me. I don't like that kind of academic censorship at all. I want all ideas, including shitty ones, to be broadcast and be readily available. So if you are, um, a, shall we say, a white nationalist and you want to promote that kind of philosophy, I would let you do that just so that I could tear you down. Because in my experience, that actually works. When sunlight is the best disinfectant, get, put your arguments forward and we'll have a chat, and then I'll prove you wrong in about five seconds because you're an idiot. And, you know that's that seems to be how that seems to be the healthiest response. Call them to ping- Ideas. Say again. Call him Pink Boy. I hate that. Pink Boy. Yeah, so like, the, no, the white, white nationalists. No, I mean, yeah. Oh yeah, and it's like white people don't exist. Shut up. Anyway, never mind. Um, moving on. Um, so yeah, that's obviously I don't approve of the censorship, but I think a lot of this stuff because as a as a mild conservative, I can speak. I can say this as much. Um, my instinct is to preserve what the good things that we have. Um, reform is. I'll entertain reform, but I won't entertain revolution um, because the system, while you might think it's flawed and because it is, um, is doesn't deserve to be destroyed, doesn't deserve to be brought down. You know, I like free market capitalism. I like the monarchy. I like British parliamentary democracy. I like this stuff and I want to keep it and I want to pass it down because it w- mostly works. But the trouble is, is that this, whether it's CRT or some mutant form offspring of crt i think it's being appropriated by bad actors who mean to break stuff they're not really interested in fixing tweaking little problems because that's really petty it's very small it's very quiet and it's kind of boring really isn't it let's be honest it's kind of boring you don't get a lot of whereas setting things on fire or you know, stirring up revolutionary fervor. Oh, that gets you in the history books, and that's you know, that's that you get photographs in the press and everything. So I think, yeah, okay, maybe a lot of the right wing reactionary stuff is overblown and uh, a bit hyster- even hysterical. But the left has got a lot of soul searching to do. It's got to look inward and say, how are we fucking this up? Because there are, and you know, you know that you admit this was the, the left is fucking this up. They, well, they, parts it's not of it. just parts of it because the majority again the fact we're really i mean we're talking about a a a limited framework here the vast majority of the black lives matter protests and the associated advocacy and the part of our democratic party and most of our educational and social institutions is one of locking arms right i mean if you could so i think you agree with me on this but if i can get you to so i (laughs) wholeheartedly denounce this this myopic liberal reactionary attitude towards anti-racism which is promoting, which promotes fear mongering and otherization. The idea that white people should feel guilty. The idea that black people should feel um, victimed, the, victimized. Right. Victimhood. Like, yeah. Like, 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 like off. Like they're being hurt by the people around them in 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 unjustified ways. What would what would be a good term for that? The idea that uh, uh, you know, what? I'll just say, oversensitive. The idea that black people are huh. whatever uh, should be oversensitive because doing so is a way of extracting penance from the privileged around them. I think these are reactionary ideas. I just think that we can fight against them without kind of promoting the narrative that may legitimately lead to like the First Amendment rights in my country being subverted by the Conservative Party, you know? Well, I don't know anything about, I mean, I, I, it's the first I've heard of the idea of the First Amendment being suppressed by the Conservative Party. In fact, the way it's been sold to me is that it's the other side of the aisle that's actually doing the subversion. Um, I mean, Black Lives Matter, I mean, it's, we're sort of drifting away from critical race theory a little bit here, but Black Lives Matter, uh, BLM, as I insist on calling it more normally, I have problems with, because again, while I could argue, while I'm happy to, to admit that Black Lives Matter as much or as little as white lives do, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to contest that point. There's something about the organisation that, I mean, I've had this conversation with Stephen Ryan, who runs a YouTube channel called Cider and Port. Um, I'll, I'll stop promoting this stuff now because I'm not getting paid. Um, but I have problems with the organisation because I think, again, bad actors have manipulated it. Um, well, I'm, the, wait, I, can I, I just say one quick thing before you continue with that? Go on. Just keep in mind that the protests here in America took hundreds of millions. The organisation is run by like it was like a few dozen people, or they had like three reps who anyone knew about. It, yeah. it, like the organization, very few people even knew about or did anything regarding the organization. It was mostly mm. just the big movement that people cared about. 
Sorry, I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt. It's just sometimes. No, no, no. And I mean, I mean, the send. It's not the. This is another thing that another aspect of this whole, uh, you know, race relations thing that bothers me. When I say that I oppose BLM, I don't oppose the sentiment of BLM. I oppose the organisation that promotes the sentiment, if you like. And I promote the movement. Why is this the only organisation that gets any broad, you know, gets broadcast, you know, gets any kind of media attention, for example? Um, I went on their public website many, many, many moons ago, and I looked at their about page, and I saw there were all sorts of things that they were standing for. Like it wasn't just about police brutality, et cetera, et cetera. It was about ending the nuclear family. It was about <laughs> ending capitalism. It was about. I mean, hang on, wait a minute. What's this got to do with about you know policemen beating up black people with sticks? That's not that's that's nothing to do with it. And so I and I became incredibly cynical about BLM because I thought, well because you're kind of sort of using the topic of police brutality, which we all agree is a problem. I mean it's just not nice, but you're using that as a kind of a a, we a wedge issue. Is that the right phrase to sort of drive in other policies that have nothing to do with it? And I'm thinking, well, no, I can't endorse it. But again, this is the problem with bad actors. This is the problem with bad with bad faith. Uh, bad faith representatives of these ideas is that they corrupt the discourse, as uh, to use that phrase, I think you've used that, and that's the stuff that people pay attention to, and that's where a lot of this backlash comes True, from. But there's a general. reason for that, though. It doesn't get paid attention to as a product of this organic exchange of information. It gets paid attention to because those are the issues that conservatives know they can best fearmonger over. Even if, and I guarantee this, even if the left was extraordinarily and disproportionately effective in promoting all of their ideas in the most optically effective way, there would be no attention driven to it. They would just work harder to find the things they could effectively fear monger over. It's always something, right? I mean, it's it's just the, when I think of Black Lives Matter, I don't even think of the organization, for example. I just, I think of the incredible spontaneous movement across this country in response I mean, it, it was around before then, but largely in response to George Floyd's murder. Um, yeah. And all the hundreds of millions who participated and protested in these peaceful protests widely across the board, you know, that broke every previous record for organic participation in anything in, in this country. And, and to so many people in this country, Black Lives Matter is represented entirely by like a trio of women who run an organization that shares its name and like Antifa in Portland. And that's it. And I don't know how you could do the math on this, but I feel like we're talking about a degree of good faith participation, which exponentially outweighs anything argumentatively, you know, negative. And yet we know where the media attention goes. So mm -hmm. I just, I have to be careful about this and I have to push back on the narrative that like the left is enabling all of this, even to the extent that they do, if they didn't at all, I don't know if it would matter. I don't know if it would change anything. I feel like, I mean, the fact that Robin D'Angelo alone commands so much attention and time, not just with you, I have to make videos on her. She's just a random fucking author. She's not even an academic. She's not like Chomsky. She's not a, a DNC operative. She's just this random white lady consultant, but everyone talks about her, including yeah. me. I don't, it, it's... It, such small avenues and axes command so much of our time and attention, but we can yeah. agree on the fundamentals, can't we? Civics, infrastructure, education, transportation, yeah. like these are things that we should be focusing yeah. on. Yeah, no, I can agree to that, yeah. But as I say, I mean, uh, the only thing I would say, I mean, just sort of like tweaking that a little bit is that, yeah, okay, there are there are right-wingers um, who do you exploit these conversations to push uh, a negative sort of like a dark agenda for want of a better phrase um but as i say i don't like the narrative i mean i'm not saying that you've promoted this but i don't like the idea that it's only the right that's fiddling with this stuff it, there are there are bad actors on the left as well the different the, the thing is vosh is that you're you're left of center i'm right of center well, at least i think i am at least in british terms um we just have to police our own houses that's essentially what we have to do we have to look at, we have to be introspective and look at our own side and just make sure that we're all behaving ourselves i'm one of my hobbies well i'd say it's a hobby it's a, it's a bloody chore is going through my own comment section ripping out all the white nationalists who sort of like dribble into my comment threads who seem to find me on tiktok that seems because again i mean i don't I don't necessarily block them, but I challenge them because I feel like I've got I've got to do that. So that's my that's my approach to the problem is just p policing the far right that sort of wanders my path. You should see my channel. I swear to God, I spend more time yelling at the left than I do the right. 
Actually, well, I have seen I have seen you do that on occasion. I was quite pleased to see that because I was I was concerned because obviously you are you know a massive online lefty. I mean, even I've heard of you. You know um, that I thought you might be forming like some sort of like you know uh, amorphous lefty militia or something you know, online of online of online acolytes. That's next year. Um, We're working on it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, baby steps, baby steps. Right. Until um, then, we got to cut the chaff a bit. No, I, I, I do agree in policing your own. It's something that I've always broken with from the rest of the left. There are people yeah. who think you're strongest when you lock arms, never look left or right, never criticize, just push, you know? Yeah, that's just wrong. It's, <laughs> it's just wrong. <laughs> there, are, there are elements where dogmatic advocacy can be effective, and that, and that comes at a cost. Dogmatism always does. But for yeah. the most part, I think that we benefit from introspection and education. The only issue is like a lot. It feels like a lot of the problems we're complaining about are so much more grounded, you know, like what like Fox News talks about, like gender neutral Mr. Potato Head and like pride parades. And then if you go on at CNN or MSNBC, for the most part, it's like, oh, a conservative congressman just publicly announced that they don't think uh, Latinos have souls. And uh, they they believe that um, there is an ancient cult of uh, Filipinos uh, who are casting a witch's spell against President Trump? All, all yeah. Americans come together and and protect him with your spiritual energy. Like that's it. Feels like there's a big disparity there, you know. Um, and well, sometimes, the, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I was interrupting you. I think. Um, but no, I mean you are right. I mean one of the reasons why the I mean you know this because I watched one of your videos was your response to the uh, December 2019 um general election in the uk where the conservatives won by a landslide and um i watched that video and obviously and all the lefties that i know uh socialists anarchists coming and i do know a lot of these people uh, were stunned they couldn't believe it was like, why 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 is the why the conservative party why are they winning all the time it's like because the conservative party are talking about bread and butter issues they're talking about pay. They're talking about Brexit. I know I'm not a big fan of Brexit, but, you know, they're talking about Brexit. They're talking about things that the ordinary people in the street actually care about. Now, you might disagree with their policies. That's a different conversation. But you guys are talking about, well, not you specifically, but the left is talking about, you know, neo-pronouns and, like, vegan lasagna or something. And it's like, you know, th this stuff is too, it's too niche. It's too high-minded. It's too academic. Well, and it's not resonating with people. I think the big issue is that the Conservative Party over there talks about the issues they told everyone to care about. I mean, the Brexit stuff, a lot of that stuff was marketed on nonsense. The Brexit Party, 18 gajillion dollars going to the EU instead of the, you know, the big mm -hmm. bus with the, right, right, right. It's good. We're speaking outside of the US and what have you, but the problem is, like, labor constantly talked about wages and lowering living costs, though. The thing is that they, the problem was, I think, if anything, it was the opposite. They focused too hard on the principal issues. They talked about economics and what people needed and cared about. You know, Corbyn's little manifesto was just chock full of things immediately relevant to the lives of people. But what did Boris Johnson, what did the conservatives do? It seems like they talk about, well, they talk about the same meaningless culture issues that republicans do here in the u.s you know brexit you know make britain strong again this flavored nationalism that gets people to vote for you when you don't actually promise anything better for their lives i confess to lacking some degree of familiarity with these issues here but i'm actually you're blackpilled on making on on addressing systemic issues i'm blackpilled on the effectiveness of talking about issues that affect people's lives it feels like this day the most you can do to get people's attention on you is to relentlessly fearmonger and like and that's just across the board i mean trump and biden came within what seven million votes of each other but the democratic yeah. party is significantly larger than the republican party and biden talked about issues affecting the average american he talked about stuff like medical costs he talked about stuff like uh wages 15 dollar an hour minimum wage trump didn't mm -hmm. talk about any of that shit trump was fucking insane the whole election run up. He talked Given about how we've. Huh? I'll let you wrap up the uh, next couple of sentences. Oh, then I'll finish my then... sentence. Then, then you can have the last go because I don't want to ramble off. I just Trump talked about insane, sh insane shit. Trump talked about like how Antifa would burn down the world and how like we needed to protect our own and you should be expelled from the country if you were burning the flag. And it felt like it was so divorced from anything that affects people's real lives, but. That cultivated quite a quite a lot of voters. I don't know. That stuff really scares me. I'm not a big fan of nationalism.
I, I, well, it depends on what national, what you mean by nationalism, I guess. Um, but I suppose if it's well, I mean, uh, just to wrap up then, because I mean, James, James wants us to. Um, yes, I mean, I don't. I mean, we can't talk really about Brexit and Corbyn and my deep, 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 deep resentment of that man because we haven't got the time, and it's it's, yeah. it's, sort, of drifting, it's, it's sort of drifting away from the main topic. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's quite possible then that the critical race theory that I'm thinking of is not CRT at all. I would concede that point, but it is what is being promoted as CRT. Um, and I resist it vehemently. And I believe that I'm doing so for the benefit of people who don't look like me. Uh, that's essentially it. Um, I think we actually agree on an awful lot, which is actually kind of scary in a weird way. Um, Gotta get but, you. Uh, yeah. yeah so, well, yeah. So, um, but as I say, I, I still, critical race theory, as I have read about it, as it's been promoted, whether it or not it's real CRT is dangerous and must be stopped. It must, we must stop it. That's, that's, that's my position. And I think we kind of sort of agree there. Um, there you go, James. Is that, is that a good enough summary? <laughs> you got it. Thank you very much. Folks, I want to remind you, our guests are linked in the description. If you haven't already clicked on their links, what are you waiting for? You can click on those links right now. And that includes if you're listening to this debate via the podcast, we put our guest links in the description box there as well. So check them out. And we are jumping into the Q&A. We are going to move quickly as Kendon. Folks, I don't know if you know, if Ken, maybe you didn't know. Kendon, what time is it right now where you are? Um, seven minutes to three in the morning. Oh, gotcha. God. So, oh yeah. Thanks for staying up so late with us, Kendon. We really do appreciate you being a team player. I'm surprised I'm still awake, mate. I have had tactical coffee, but I'm surprised I'm still awake. Ooh. Cider and port happens to be the first one chiming in. Says, Kendon, you know we're friends, but I have to root for Vosh on this one. Vosh's sex appeal is just too much. I, I think anyone who was attracted to me would be attracted to Kendon for and vice versa. All my chat has been yeah. doing is making jokes about how there are two of me or two of you on the screen. I get lots of this. I mean, I, obviously, if I take my glasses <laughs> off, people on TikTok say that I look like Jack Black as well. So I get lots of duet videos with me looking like Jack Black and things like that. So, um, no, I mean, uh, well, I mean, St Stephen, I, I know that you're a mad Irish socialist lefty wonk. Therefore, you have to side with Vosh. It's like the law or something. So I don't take it personally, although you spurn my love, you bastard. Carry on. Um <laughs> <laughs> this one coming in from UKPI says, we pick out differences in people. It's inherent. I'm not sure what their point is. Uh -huh. I'm not sure. Just it early. Yeah, I'll just I wait. I'll just, I'll just say, yeah, we do. I just, what, what are you, what are you going to get from that? You know? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the, uh, I'm, I'm like, I'm with James on this one. I'm not sure what the point ultimately was. Um, if they could elaborate, that'd be great. But uh, yeah. Next one coming in from the Batman says too much agreeing. Can we get Vosh versus JF on CRT? Well, we'll see. Oh, wait, what hold, wait, hold on. Wait, wait. Just, just want to be perfectly clear. Who, what'd you just say? Who, oh, Brent, who's, who's, who's JF? Oh, J, who's JF Curry. He, he's a Nazi. Um, the um. Oh, oh, he's one of them. He's a twat. I see. Right. So yes, no scum. The conversations yeah. like that are this are infinitely more productive than any conversation I could ever have. Like he doesn't even believe in democracy. Of course, he's not going to. But he does. He believes in a white ethno state. Of course, he disagrees with critical race theory. Like obviously. Yeah, you know, but, but, this is, but this is the thing. Is like, I. I mean, I, so can I? I'm sorry. I'm going to pick we, up on this. Right. We, I'm one of the. I used to. I used to live in the Middle East. As part when I was a teacher at 24, I emigrated to Oman, and I used to teach in a British high school out there. So I'm one of the few people I know who's actually lived in an ethno state. I've been to places like you know Thailand, Japan, or whatever. Why does anybody want to live in an ethno state? It's boring. It's ultimately boring. You know, they have no idea the world was. I mean, um, well, never mind. I just anyway, that's, that's just no. The, the just, most I despair at the species sometimes. The really most do. functional ethno state e country in the West is Japan, and their their social infrastructure is crumbling because they have a in hard a time attracting years. workers, and well, nobody fucks over there. Yeah, and, and yeah, and I was going to say, in a hundred years, according to the economists, the ethnic Japanese will be extinct because they're not breeding fast enough. They're just, you know, their populations are dying out, and they're in like two hundred percent GDP and national debt, and they've got no idea how foreign cultures work because they never really interact with them. So yeah, it's a bit, but not, yeah, carry on. Well, Sorry, James, we're, James wants us to move on. <laughs> no worries. We've got this one coming in from Shiga Wire. Thanks so much for your support. I couldn't agree more. They said great discussion, and so. Ken and you. Vosh, thank you guys. It's been a pleasure. As Cider and Port chimes in again saying, Vosh officially now knows who I am. So it's official. I can now die a happy man. Kendon, we must speak soon. So you both yeah. have a fan in Steven. And Farron Salas says, 
seeing James in full black. Quote, this Prince of Darkness has arrived, a.k.a. Little Nicky. I am a huge old Adam Sandler movie fan, so thanks for that reference. And says thank you so much to the debaters. I couldn't agree more. Our guests are linked in the description, folks. Click those links. And JP says, Vosh is wrong. Rama D'Angelo has written critical social justice and critical pedagogy books beyond white fragility. Her work is be based in critical theory and common in college pedagogy classes. Uh, wait, pedagogy? Wait. Pedagogy means teaching. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Pedagog. Method yeah. of teaching. Okay. So, I'll so, just... so, 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 you're, so, what, so what this person in the comment section is saying is that Robin D'Angelo is not just a freak of nature, but she's actually tapping into something real that's in colleges. Is that, I, is that a better point? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm sure there are some professors who favor her writing, but I was, I mean, I, I'm a sociology major and I was fairly tapped into the Pacific Northwest sociology um, environment, and I just did not see... This stu I'll, I'll say this much, okay? Not only from my schooling, but from the experiences that I've had everywhere outside an incredibly specific subset of people online, people do not seem to like the stuff that Robin D'Angelo has to say. It usually seems to be enjoyed by, like, guilty white suburban wine moms who are latently <laughs> racist but feel yeah. kind of bad about it, and they want to overcompensate for it by, like... by. <laughs> This the kind the kind of people who sweat a little bit when they meet their black neighbor and say person of color <laughs> like to their face, you know? No, I mean well, person of color, that's a phrase that needs to be scrapped. I mean, person of color and colored person are pretty much the same thing. I don't like it because again, it's generic. It's like, well, what color what color are they then? Well, I don't understand. Is that little things like that that wind me up? Um, but I mean, this is the thing. I mean, I, as I say, we, we disagree on what is CRT and whatever. Um, uh, this kind of sort of COD CRT stuff, it can't defeat institutional racism because it basically is institutional racism, just a different form of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, well, if, if this... I think POC it, just gets used as a shorthand for non-white, which is useful in a lot of American racial discussions because we have a general understanding of the histories and contexts in which different racial groups deal with different stuff in this country, but I imagine that term kind of falls apart outside of at least white majority countries. You would ever use POC in, in like, India, right? Because, like, what would... Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, like, oh, yeah, there's white people in POC in, in Delhi? Like, okay, you know, <laughs> what, what's the point? Um, yeah, anyway, with regards to Robin D'Angelo stuff, I don't, I don't have, like, data on the acceptance of her work, but no. I, I, look, even if we accept that the ideas are super duper popular, I think we can fight against them without fighting against anti-racism. I think that's something we have to preserve fundamentally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. And this one coming up from Made by Jim Bob Suz. Huh? Vosh, does critical race theory have predictive power at the level of the individual? If so, give us an example. Critical race theory doesn't make predictions about people's behavior on an individual level, so it wouldn't... It, Critical race theory is just a lens of analysis on racial issues, which factors into account the disparate um, uh, material and ideological goals and interests of those groups. It's critical theory distilled through a racial lens, but that doesn't have like predictive capabilities. It's not like an economic theory. So an example of like critical race theory in its like most distilled sociological form would be like, uh, it, it, you would ask a question, you know, why did the Civil Rights Act get passed? And then you could answer it. Well, there were conflicting interests between the black and white populations in America, which were reified somewhat by the increasingly multiracial nature of the of the um, of the civil rights protests and the outside pressure of different racial groups who are comparing the United States racial apartheid to the Soviet Union. It's a way of like factoring things in through conflict, you know, and then there's a whole legal side of things. But no, it's not about making individual predictions. Can I leap on that, James? Is that allowed? Sure. Yeah. So in support of Vosh, actually, um, one of the things that really winds me up with this new sort of like weird racial tribal division thing that's happening in, in Western cultures is that the only reason uh, you don't want to encourage antagonism between black and white, which is effectively what this sort of bad faith uh, pseudo CRT stuff is doing, because ultimately the only reason why black people got the vote in your country is because white people gave it to them. So it was in the interest James of people Charles outside, and of the group, outside of the tribe. Um, I'm, I'm sort of simplifying it, mm -hmm. helped to achieve that goal. 
Whereas if you divide people on racial lines, which is effectively what's happening now with these with sort of bad faith actors, it's encouraging conflict, which is not going to resolve any problems. So we do need to come together in, in more sense. And I don't think that the way that this is be the subject is being handled is going to help that. You know, if, if there are if there are like systemic issues, as Ross says. Uh, but uh, you know that affects black people more than white people. You can't segregate the races and then pit them against each other. Um, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. To be no, honest, no, I, I completely agree. Problem. Yeah, we have to work arm in arm. We can't. The, the this is one of the reasons why I hate these woke TikTok Zoomers who are like sixteen years old have a toddler's understanding of racial theory, and they're like, yeah. uh, you know, uh, actually. Um, using any of these commonly used terms is AAVE and therefore racist if you're a white. And it's like, bruh, in there, and like, lit. And it's like, what are you accomplishing when you say this? Like, what Like, what do you, what, what dream are you working to achieve by getting white people to look at this and like, oh, from now on, I'll just say, yippee. <laughs> With something interesting out, what are you getting out of this? Nothing. Well, it's like, well, this is this is why I hate the. I mean, we didn't talk about it really, but I hate the concept of microaggression because, like, basically anything can be a microaggression if you abuse that idea thoroughly. Um, you know, people would start treading on your words. What do you mean by that statement? What do you mean by this gesture and all the rest of it? And it encourages. It's almost like a, I mean, I hate to use the word thought crime because it's a bit of a it sounds conspiratorial, but that's the kind of thing. And it's a it's a bunch of as you pointed out, a bunch of zoomers on on social media who are policing this stuff. And it's like you don't actually know what you're talking. Yeah, about. Engagements like that have to be done in good faith. Like for me, originally yeah. when I heard the term microaggression, you know, it would be like oh, here's the example I was given in school, right? It's um. It's uh, um, you are a black business owner. You're wearing a suit. You know, you're standing in like a new office and there's like a white guy who's I painting the walls next to you. He's wearing a painter's outfit. Contractor yeah. comes in, says, oh, hello, walks up and shakes the painter's hand. Now, that to me. Now, is this like explicitly racist? You know, not really. You can't really know. But like if I was the black dude in the suit, like you're in a suit, you're standing there and the guy deliberately goes to the person who's painting you have to, it's it's a thing to wonder about like well i don't know if it was racist but damn it felt like a little bit and the response to that the response to like feeling that is not to freak out about it or anything it's just to like to categorize and understand your thoughts and maybe if you're like uh, prone to doing stuff like that like asking like asian people in america where they're from like stuff like that's another one you know because like there are pe there are asians in america who have been here for 150 years like well, where are you from up. and they're like go the next one Oh, sorry. They're from, like, from LA, and you're like, "Well, where are you really from?" And it's like, "I don't know. I'm from LA." Sorry. Okay, my apologies. No worries. Thank you very much for this one. Made by Jim Bob says, "Bosh, what does quote unquote white mean? Are Irish and German people the same?" White means literally whatever the person saying the word wants it to mean. It is a highly variable category that has absolutely no intrinsic value, and it is frequently misused and abused to serve people's political interests. If we can all understand the arbitrariety of the term, then maybe we could stop doing that. Yeah, um, I support Vosh in that one. The word white has been abused, and there are populations that have been considered white that have lost their white. Irish people, for example, were not considered white, even though they're as pink as I am, inarguably pinker, paler. Uh, Jews, Ashkenazim, for example, are you know, sort of considered plastic white people for the purposes of racism and were exploited for centuries and are now considered white people by elements of the woke left. Um, but that's a reason. So basically, white is a social construct. It's not a racial thing. There's no way you can identify a white person because also you've never actually met a white person. They've all been pink. Oh, the only white people who exist are albinos. Like they're the only ones that. They're. So you know, the, the it, 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 basically white means nothing. It can mean, but white means nothing because it can mean anything. There you go. Gotcha. Thank you. And then Andrew Roos, thank you very. That's right, Andrew Rouse. Thank you very much for your super chat and your kind words. Do appreciate it. And. Nala Black says, Vosh, the 2020 riots caused nearly $2 billion in damage across the country. That is way more than a quote unquote few buildings being burned down. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also less than that year's total for um, police departments in America paying out um, settlements for uh, court cases that they lost or did not want to have. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, $2 billion really? of damage is a lot, but wait, hold on really quickly. Um, New, wait, what was the New York City? New York City PD um, settlement 
year. How much did New York City's police department on New York City in NYCPD in in 2018? 230 million on its own. One city, a quarter billion dollars from one police department. So just keep this that I in did, mind. This I did not know. I am. Yeah. OK, that's uh, that's rather disconcerting. Not saying um, it's not bad or anything like I'm just saying, like, keep just keep some perspective on all this, you know. Gotcha. And this one coming in from do appreciate it. Jazor says, I hope everyone has a blessed day. Praise Satan. Great opportunity to remind you folks, no matter what walk of life you were from, we are glad you were here. I don't know if they're a real Satanist, but either way, we're glad you're here. And Wits It Gets It says, CRT teaches racism. Children don't come out of the womb racist. They love each other based on actions. Leave their innocence alone. It's child abuse. Nope. Nobody's teaching critical race theory to children. I just... What, whatever we're describing as critical race theory today, I promise you they are not getting taught it in elementary school, okay? just It's okay. No, it's going to be okay. No, it, yeah, I think what we've established, what, what Vosh and I have established is that what I think of as critical race theory, what is marketed as critical race theory, isn't CRT. The problem is, is that at this point, it doesn't really matter now because we've now got to mop up the mess that's been created by yeah. um, by the D'Angelo clan and uh, people like her. Um, yeah, there you go. Fair enough. Carry on. <laughs> you got it in. Made by Jim Bob Strikes Again says, Vosh, what would you say if... Sorry, I lost. Okay, they say, what would you say it's if I cost. told you Stone Toss was a black lesbian? Um, Who? I'd be very proud of them and their journey. Who, who's Stone Toss? Oh, a know. Nazi. It, oh, it, yeah. Oh, okay. Gosh, you okay. Proud of them and their yeah. journey. I need. I, I. I clearly don't hang around on the internet as much as I thought I did. I mean, I. You know, never mind. I don't you clearly know. hang out in better <laughs> groups than I do. I, I. Do you know what? Do you know who I'd really? I mean, Vosh, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I really hope we get to do this again. But the person I really want to interview is Richard Spencer. I really want to have a chat with that bugger. Um, I don't know how I'd do it because he probably wouldn't talk to me. Uh, what my massive Israeli flag hanging behind me? Um, but uh, you know, I just, um, I just really, really want to speak to him because I, I would love to talk to one of these people face to face. It would be amazing. Anyway, carry on. I'm just sorry. This is no, I, no. Not... I've really enjoyed the conversation too. I'm sure there are strings that I could pull if we talk in the future. Yeah. Oh, well, cool. That'd be great. Uh, you got do it. Do we have any more? Do we have any more questions, James? I mean, we do. We have not too many more. I promise I'll get you to sleep soon. Sorry about that, Kendon. And I'm we high have on a... caffeine, James. I don't really care at this point. I'm 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 performance enhancing drugs right now. Just 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 carry on. Do what you feel. <laughs> you uh, got it. Three hundred three io says. This is why debates are important. More of this and less toxicity. So glad you enjoyed it. Glad to hear that. And Will Stewart says. Vosh, do you not think it's because these issues are being talked about in elementary, middle, and high school classrooms by wine-drinking white ladies that you get 16-year-old Zoomers ranting on TikTok? Nah, those 16-year-olds get their info from the internet. They misread and half-read other TikToks and YouTubers. I promise you they are not getting that stuff. The black separatist TikTok crowd is not getting that theory from their middle school teachers, okay? No. I promise you. The only stuff that's getting... See, this is what I mean. Like, everything gets called CRT. You know what's being taught in elementary schools that you're referring to? The idea that, like, racism exists, that it's a problem, that racism is in America, that the founding fathers owned slaves. Like, this is the stuff that kids get taught. They're not getting taught, like, crazy weird shit about, like, uh, you know... <laughs> there is a racial hierarchy, and we must isolate everybody according to race. No, that's not, that's not what they've been taught. Not yet, no. yeah. I mean, maybe, like, there are always going to be elements of imperfect education all around the world, but, like, I just, I do not think kids are being taught racist, being taught to be racist in elementary school by, like, woke lefty teachers or something. I just, I don't know. I mean, a lot of the stuff, I mean, I know I have a lot of American conservative um, followers on TikTok and a lot of creators follow me as well. And they're getting canceled by um, this kind of weird sort of like 
black separatist black nationalist mob but that and they they claim it's they they use the phrase critical race theory but again are they really using critical race theory at all or are they just you know anti-white racist assholes um but so yeah it's it's not you don't need to go to school to get this stuff you just have to spend time on tumblr for about like 25 minutes or something and I, you'll get enough i just wish we were specific with it they like uh, do, do you feel bad that kids are being taught that white people are inherently racist or something like give me like a specific thing donors you know like I, so i can respond to that and i don't think they're getting taught that in school either but you mm. know easier yeah. that way you got it this one coming in from pentagon anonym thank you so much says i agree with both of you i'm romanian and i live in the uk so you could they put in parentheses uh so white i guess but yeah. i do feel like i've been discriminated against sometimes yeah, well, I, 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 can, I can side with him because Romanians in uh, Britain are dismissed as sort of like two steps up from uh, homeless thieves and things like that. They, they get a lot of abuse uh, from other Eastern European populations in the UK as well, including Poles. Um, but uh, yeah, so the Roman Romanians are discriminated against, yet they're as pink as most of the most British people, you know. So yeah, that's this is another reason why I don't like what I think of as CRT, because it ignores sort of intra-white racism. And one of the reasons there. you got to focus on intersectional <laughs> racial theory, because... Uh... That is all about understanding the nuances in how people divide each other and, uh, you know, hurt them with those categorizations. About the intersectionality. Gotcha. Uh, we, and we, we, we could run about that all day. Carry on. Uh, <laughs> this one coming in from Samuel Lillaholm. Appreciate it. Says from <clears throat> from a very introductory search, it appears to me that CRT suggests. US, the U.S. has systems which are intertwined with racism, yet I sincerely don't see that. Am I misunderstanding CRT? That's one of the fundamental assumptions of the legal wing of critical race theory. And yeah, it's 100 percent true. So there is evidence of explicit, implicit and um, temporal bias in our criminal justice system. We have studies on implicit bias in jury selections, which means because we have a jury of our peers, that bias in the population affects bias in our court rulings. We have explicit, implicit, and temporal biases evidenced in our police. We have said biases expressed in the ways in which our economic systems reflect in legal outcomes. We have these biases in redlining. We have these, bi these biases exist all over the place. And these aren't just biases that exist by happenstance. At best of times, they exist simply because they're the remnant of longstanding racial discrimination, which stopped, but then never got fixed or patched up. And at worst, they're a product of existing explicit or implicit bias that could be brought about or measured and studied. Take a look at the federal investigators report into the police department of Ferguson, if you don't believe me. That report was done back in what, 2015, 2016? And it's incredible how if you really investigate it, you can break a city down into layers and it is just fucked from head to toe. Like sometimes it's people deliberately being racist and sometimes it's just, just they didn't care. They just let it keep happening, you know, for decades and decades and generations. That report is incredible. And that's just one city. You got it. And this one coming in from Ryan Hamilton. Let's see. Said, Vosh, did you watch Adam and Sitch's nine hour response to your video criticizing your response to PragerU on CRT? I can't watch those guys. I'll just. I'll have them on sometime if they want, ma'am. I can't go over their videos. They're, my When I do a video, it makes the original video 10 times as long. If I do a video on theirs and then they do a video on mine, we'll, we'll never get to do any other videos. We have to stop. <laughs> yeah, there's a kind of response culture that I don't really understand. Because, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 35, though, so I'm older than you. Um, I've only started making content in the last, like, six months. And there's oh, this kind congratulations. Of... You've done very well for yourself. Well, I, if you say so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I talk into a phone, Bosch. It's hardly, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's hardly, it's, hardly all right. it's, it's not that great. But no, um, but there's a kind of real sort of like response culture whereby you, res uh, someone puts out a video, someone responds to the video, and then someone responds to the response to the video, and it's just like you, you don't create anything original. You're just mixing around the same swill, and I don't quite understand it. If I'm being honest, it's like don't you want something a bit fresh? Don't you want another one? No, I'll never original. go more than one deep. Um, I I'd be happy to talk to them. I mean. I've invited mm. them on before, and I think. Yeah. Juicy. And we'll retweet that, folks. That sounds fun. But Forward Tribe says, 
you've established that poor immigrants and children, in parentheses, can achieve immense wealth, and still you say that 100 years just doesn't make it possible for black people to. Okay, let me tear into this guy really quickly. Okay, first of all, you're a fucking moron, and you should look for a rebate on any educational material you've received in your past, okay? If you live in America, you need to go and you need to find the dean of the educational institution that you attended, and you need to strangle them until you get your money back, okay? Because that is not how statistics work. All right. We're talking about averages against populations here. Hundreds of millions of people. Uh, did you do, 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 do black people? Did you know Obama was president? So could you racism really exist? Come on. Think. All right. Jesus. No. Obviously, on average, there are systemic biases that affect huge populations, but there are going to be exceptions within those populations. The majority of immigrants that arrive to our country are wealthy when they arrive because it's expensive to move to another country. But when we're talking about like immigrants from Mexico, where they usually just come up from the border, like illegal immigrants, the vast majority of them stay poor their whole lives. Some of them, I imagine, become extra- extraordinarily wealthy, but that doesn't like remove the barriers to the rest of them you you, you've provided invalid examples okay the 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 existence of statistical anomalies does not negate other statistical truths it's just please stop i hear this argument so much i'm sorry for being mean i take it back james that was very uncouth of me i apologize it happens and i think is this (laughs) miss tree in the chat is this the miss tree i'm thinking of says Want to see modern systemic racism? Look at all the black entrepreneurs still in prison for selling weed and the white CEOs controlling companies now ta- taking over the industry as it legalizes. True. Based, based in yeah, true. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that's uh, it's one of the great ironies, isn't it? That these people, I mean, uh, uh, that the... the they, they arrest people for selling weed, and yet the greatest drug dealer in the Western world is the Starbucks Corporation. Um, I've always, you know, it, it, it does seem a bit odd that, um, well, it's just a thing. I would, to be honest, I'd grant them amnesty, because if all they're in, if they're only, only in for selling marijuana, then it's hardly the, the destructive drug that, say, crack cocaine is. So, you know, just let or them go. Or opiates. <laughs> or opiates, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, but there's a lot of money in addiction. Uh, just look at the drinks industry. Um, but there we go. Um, get massive kickbacks. Sorry, my, my computer's misbehaving now. Uh, what are you doing? Sorry, you don't got mind. it. Just, just and oh. I do want to see. Do we have any questions for Kendon? I am like blown away. That's because we're Vosh, because Vosh, Vosh is the celebrity. I'm just some random. No, I've person. been on this channel before, and there's like a community of people who jump on on James's channel to like see about me in his chat. So it's usually people from that end who hate me. Oh, so it's entirely, it's entirely personal. I just want to get a rise out of you. Okay. But we want to let you know, folks, our guests are linked to the description. We, it's difficult for us to express just how much we appreciate these guys. Thank you very much, Vosh and Kendon. Seriously, it has been a true pleasure to get to have, hang out with you guys, have you on. And so thank you guys. James, as always, it is a massive delight to spend any time with you. And Kendon, this actually ended up being like six times the conversation I expected to be. Um, I'd be more than happy to have you on stream in other contexts sometime in the future. I really appreciate you taking the time, man. No, well, thank you very much uh, for, for lowering yourself to speak to me today. Thank you very much, James, for arranging it. Thank you again, uh, Leo Phileas, for suggesting it, and uh, Stephen Ryan of YouTube Channel Cider Report for making for insisting that this happen. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, it's been a pleasure to speak to you, Vosh. Uh, I'm just as surprised as you are, to be fair. Um, but yeah, let's do it again because um, on something. Equally as contentious, I don't know, uh, trans issues or something. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, issues. we'll find something, set, I'm sure. Set fire to the internet with our, our, our Bob diatribe. Um, yeah. Or we can just uh, build see. Warhammer models and compare them. Yeah, we could just, like, just, you know, I get out my Death Guard and you get out. I mean, you, do you just do Age of Sigma or do you do Warhammer 40K as well? I've, I've got a Skitari behind me too, so I do Yeah, both. you did. You did mention Adeptus Mechanicus. Yeah, you know, no, fair enough. We'll just like sit there painting painting models, talking talking shit. You know, that's, that's, why not? Um, battle yeah, painting. But, yeah. Battle painting. Yeah, like my models are better than your. Yeah, no. It's, yeah, why not? <laughs> just do something other than that. Uh, yeah, okay. And uh, thank you. Yeah. I'll, I've run out of Take care. Um, thank you. Thank you. And then last last minute question. Oh. River killed the oh. doctor. Says Kendon, I have a question for you. Are you a clone of Vosh? No, this. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. We don't, He's we older don't... than me. Wouldn't I be the clone? 
Exactly. We don't we don't look that similar just because we've got beards <laughs> and glasses on and we're both pink. That's not, no, that's this is my top. entire fucking community. Any time it's a guy with a beard and glasses, that's all they need. We don't have the Appar- same hair. It's yeah, just uh, uh, apparently I look like a TikTok <laughs> called Papa Gut as well. There's a guy called Papa Gut on TikTok, and, I, and I've actually watched some of his videos, and I look nothing like him. It's like he's he's bald for a start. Anyway, never mind. This is real um, racism, by the way, saying all white people look all alike. This look is, yeah, same, exactly. Yeah. This is critical race theory. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see? I can I can imagine. I'm gonna see the clip of uh, just you saying that, Vosh, on Twitter. So we, hey, you're a white everything. guy with a beard and glasses, James. I don't get. <laughs> well, you're yoked, of course. So yeah, Kendon. I don't know. You can't tell because he's very modest, but he's actually like six foot five, and he looks like a bodybuilder. By the way, that's not uh, true. Vosh is telling stories again. But we, true. folks, I will be back in a moment with a post credit scene, letting you know about juicy upcoming debates. For example, tomorrow, JF will be taking on Alex Stein on whether or not the police are systemically racist. And so we'll be back in just a moment with updates on that. And so one last time, I want to say thanks so much to our guests. It's been a true pleasure to have you guys.